Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we're to hear from Mr Cook this morning, sir. Yeah, and before uh, Mr Cook is sworn, can I thank him for agreeing to appear at 9.30 at very short notice? It's of help to the inquiry, Mr Cook, so thank you very much. You're, you're more than welcome. Thank you, sir. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Miss Cook, uh, my name is Sam Stevens. I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Could I ask you to state your full name, please? Alan Ronald Cook. Thank you for. Uh, giving evidence to the inquiry today. Uh, in front of you, there should be a witness statement. Yes. That runs to 106 paragraphs. Do you have that in front of you? I do. Uh, for the record, the document reference number is WITN 00190100. Could I, um, before I ask you to turn to your signature, could we please turn to paragraph 89, which is on page 30 of the statement? Yep. Um, I understand there's a point of clarification you wish to make in respect of that paragraph. There is indeed, but I wonder, Mr Smith, if I could just say before we get started, um, I'd like to put on record most strongly uh, my personal apology and sympathies with all sub-postmasters, their families and those affected by this. As we get into the conversation, obviously, there'll be an opportunity for me to elaborate, but it just felt to me that was a, an important thing for me to say up front. Um, in, in terms of paragraph 89, it, it, it cites um, a couple of letters that I had received from MPs, uh, which was correct at the time or, um, I believe to be correct at the time I wrote this, but uh, since the document was submitted, some further documents have been released by the inquiry, which show that there were three more cases. So, so that it was correct at the time, uh, and I'm just seeking to clarify that you know that there's nothing wrong with the statement as it stood then, but there have been three cases identified since. So, at the time you signed the statement, you believed paragraph 89 to be true, but okay. you've since received further documents that show that there were further letters sent. Correct, correct. Subject to, well, no, before we do that, can I ask you please to turn to page 36? Yes. Is that your signature? It is. And are the facts stated in that witness statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. Thank you. That stands as your evidence in the inquiry. I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Mm -hmm. um, very briefly, in terms of your background, you were appointed as a non-executive director of Post Office Limited on the 23rd of February 2005. Mm -hmm. You nodded, yes. Yes, sorry. Um, in your statement, you describe uh, having a long and varied career in public and private sectors. A another nod. Yes, indeed. You were chief executive officer of National Savings and Investments from September 2002. Correct. Now, you held that role whilst you were a non-executive director of Post Office Limited, is that right? Correct. But in March 2006, you were appointed as managing director of Post Office Limited. Correct. And at that point, you stepped down from National Savings and Investment Bank. Correct. We don't need to turn it up, uh, but in your witness statement, you refer to the role of non-executive director and, and you say that you had a duty to challenge management on any aspect of the business and their proposed approach to both running the running of the business and the direction in which Post Office Limited was being taken. And you still agree with that? I do. In order to carry out that duty effectively, you would need to know broadly uh, what the Post Office's operations were. Would Correct. You? How were you introduced or inducted to the business when you became a non-executive director? 
So, as I've explained in my statement, I had quite a bit of dealings with the post office prior to becoming a non-executive director because the post office was the primary distribution channel for the national savings and investment products. So that's how I got to know uh, some of the people at, at the post office. Um, however, it's a different order of magnitude if you become a board member. Um, and so they've set up a program for me, um, going around visiting a number of branches, visiting heads of different functions inside the building, um, and uh, so that, it, I mean, it lasted for several months, to be honest, on and off. Obviously, this, is, this was not a full-time role, um, uh, because I had a full-time role with, with National Savings, who were happy to allow me to do this. But, uh, so it, it was a reasonably comprehensive induction. Do you remember getting uh, any talks or, or induction sessions from the legal department at Post Office Limited? Um, I, I can't remember. I can't remember a particular event or a particular person that I saw. Um, I, I, I would have probably been updated uh, by that area from the finance director, Peter Corbett, um, would, would be my recollection. When you sat as a non-executive director, did you apply or take into account any codes relevant to corporate governance and management? Um, this is the first time I had been a non-executive director. I, I had been on boards that had non-executive directors on them. Um, the, the, the corporate governance code, I, I've gone on in later life to spend a lot of time working on boards. so. Um, I, I would confess much more expert, expert now than I, than I was then. Um, but certainly uh, I was well aware of my overall responsibilities in terms of challenging management. I was aware that I was not the decision maker and that I had to contribute to the conversation uh, and you know, express reservations if I felt so, so, so inclined or supportive comments if it felt to me the right thing to do. Just to clarify your evidence, when you were non-executive director, do you think you would have applied the Financial Reporting Council corporate code or not? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and in your view, were your expectations for the standards of corporate governance in a publicly owned company like Post Office Limited different to your expectations for a publicly listed company? Um, well, they were... Um it, it is different. It, it was different. Um, I, had, I had a board at National Savings and Investment, which I sat on as, as the chief executive rather than as a non-executive director. Um, but um, on that National Savings and Investments board, I was outnumbered by the non-executives uh, deliberately. That would, be, that would be a typical feature. So there were more people in the room that were independent than were employed. Uh, this uh, the post office board was the other way round. So the, it was primarily the senior management team, uh, Sir Mike Hodgkinson, who you saw yesterday, who was the chairman, was a non-executive. There was uh, Brian Goggin, who was the chief exec of Bank of Ireland, and then myself. So, so both of us, both of the two independent directors, ha had also business relationships with the post office, if you see what I mean. Uh, how... The what you refer to as being outnumbered and it being the other way around on the yeah. Post Office Limited Board. Uh, to what extent did that affect the adequacy of the corporate governance or oversight? I think corporate governance uh, is better performed if the non-executives are greater in number than the executives, if you see what I mean. Um, that doesn't mean to say it's, it's, it's no good, but I think it's a, it would be of a higher standard with more independence on the board. And why weren't there more independence on the um, Limited Board? Not, not known to me. What I would say is that that board was a subsidiary to the Royal Mail Holdings Board, where, yes, indeed, the independents were in the majority. So, uh, you know, I think technically, if you looked at it, it was OK, because the Royal Mail parent had that independence. Uh, to what extent were you involved with the Royal Mail business whilst you were a non-executive director? Um, very little, really. Well, I, I would go, as part of my induction, I might have gone to some of the functions that sat in Royal Mail working for the post office, for example. But in terms of the business activities of Royal Mail, 
then I, I didn't get very involved in that at all. Looking at responsibilities, would you agree that the Post Office Limited Board was responsible for oversight of the operations of the Post Office business? Correct, yes. Do you agree with this, that the identification, analysis and management of risk is very important to running a company? Indeed. And do you accept that Post Office Limited, or the board of Post Office Limited, was responsible for overseeing how the executive team identified, analysed and managed risk? Correct, yes. Let's go to your appointment uh, as Managing Director, March 2006. And please could we bring up the witness statement at page 16, paragraph 46. You set out how you, the background to you becoming um, or being appointed as managing director. And you say at the bottom half, <clears throat> I therefore accepted the role of managing director with the understanding that I would have full accountability and responsibility for the post office limited business, but, th that I but that I would be dependent on Royal Mail Group for delivery or oversight of certain functions, for example, HR, legal, finance, and IT. Uh, so are you effectively saying you have ultimate executive accountability for the operations of the post office limited company, but you're not responsible for the services provided by Royal Mail Group? I have accountability, yes, but the, the, um, the responsibility wasn't direct. Um, what do you mean by that? Um, the people that were doing that work did not work for me or somebody that worked for me. Which people are you referring to? In, in those shared service functions, HR, legal, so, finance, and so, so where Royal Mail Group are, are providing it, you're Correct. not responsible for, for those people, is that what you're Yes, saying? that's right, yes. I'm not saying I'm not responsible for the issues, but the people were Yes, the people, yes. Well, not pay and rations post office employees, if you see what I mean. And what was your view on legal being a group function? Um, it, in large groups, it's, it's, not, un, it's not uncommon um, because you, you, if you centralise you know, a specialist expertise, you can probably get a higher standard group by having them central and, and building a career for lawyers or HR or, or finance or whatever it is. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was a little reluctant when I was being offered the job because I would prefer to have had my arms round everything right um, uh, on the other hand as I had to say in my witness statement uh, it was sort of an understand it, I understood the aspiration from a Royal Mail group perspective why it would be sensible to achieve those those synergies by having specialist functions centralized um, and in the conversations I was having about being appointed when I was offered the role I was sort of exercised uh, this may sound like ego and it's not meant to be at all I was exercised by the fact that David Mills, my predecessor, was the chief executive of the post office and I was being offered the job of managing director. And, and so my suspicion was, was I going to have the same level of accountability that, that, that David had had? Um, and I was persuaded during these conversations in the build-up that it, that it would work. Um, I felt rather embarrassed that I'd sort of confessed any ego over a job title. It wasn't about the job title, it was about the accountability. And accountability you accepted? Yes, yes. And you, can, you earlier referred to, when I asked about um, legal being a group function, you referred to legal being centralised in other group companies. Mm. Are you aware of another group uh, of companies where um, legal is centralised at the group level or the parent level um, and the subsidiary carries out or is responsible for um, prosecuting members of its own workforce? No, I'm sure not. Do you think Post Office Limited would have benefited from its own legal team? Um, well, I would have liked its own legal team. Um, I, I, would have, I would have felt happier, I would have felt more accountable. I'm, I'm not saying to you that the problems would have been unearthed massively quicker as a result, but um, I would have been closer to the issue. 
And what, what was stopping you from having your own legal team? Well, it was not the proposed organisational structure, so it, wasn't, it, it was a, a non-negotiable when I was being appointed. When you were on, as ma managing director, you sat on the Royal Mail board? Did, Correct. Uh, so did that mean you had some oversight of Royal Mail's legal department? And, and that's how I got my head round this structure being OK, was at the end of the day, it's not like I wasn't going to be on the board of Royal Mail Holdings, which, which I was. Obviously, that's... That's, that's high up, but the, um, the board, as I said earlier, was in the majority of non-execs, and then there were four business unit heads, effectively, the Royal Mail Letters business, Parcel Force, uh, GLS, which was a European parcels business, and Post Office. Yes. So I was one of four. Could we turn, please, in your statement, um, page 7, paragraph 24... You say in the middle, uh, however, over time, I came to realise that the board, and you're referring to the Post Office Limited Board, the board's scope was not as broad as I would have expected. What do you, what, um, how did the board's scope um, not match with your expectations? Well, a an example would be um, that the audit committee that existed um, was the, the Royal Mail Holdings Audit Committee. And, and hang out, hung off the Royal Mail Holdings Board. There was no audit committee for the Post Office Limited Board. Um, so that's just an example of, of the scope uh, that, that um, reliance was placed on Royal Mail Holdings governance as well as Post Office Limited governance. You know, otherwise, for example, producing the annual results and having the accounts audited was a process that would have been run through an audit committee and that audit committee was at the Royal Mail Holdings level, which I freely accept I was on the board of Royal Mail Holdings, but I'm, I'm just saying it's from a post office limited board's perspective. They, they, were, uh, they weren't the accountable party. So th that sounds, you're talking about the audit committee there, but in, in terms of how you could um, oversee the operations of the business on a day-to-day -day level, were you satisfied that the post office board uh, had sufficient scope to do that task adequately. Yes, yes. You say in your witness statement, we don't need to turn it up, um, that there was a risk and compliance committee. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, the risk and compliance committee sat below the Post Office Limited Board. Correct. Was it a formal subcommittee of the board or an executive committee? Um, well, it was a, f a formal subcommittee of the board, but it was primarily comprising of executives, for, as I explained earlier, yeah. So in those circumstances, would you accept that it's good governance for the minutes of those committee meetings to be submitted and reviewed by the board? It would be, yes. I want to turn now to Post Office prosecutorial role. Mm -hmm. Now, it's obviously one of the issues the inquiry is examining is how that role was overseen. Now, your evidence, which we will come to shortly, is that you were unaware that Post Office was involved in the prosecution of sub-postmasters until May 2009. No, that's not quite right. I was, I was unaware that the Post Office were the prosecuting authority, if you see what I'm, I knew there were court cases, but I didn't realise that post office, in about two-thirds of the cases, had initiated the prosecution, I see. as opposed to, um, you know, the DPP or the police or, or whatever. So... Just to clarify... And to clarify that, so you're, you're saying you were, you were aware that the business investigated fr theft, fraud and false accounting... Yeah but you thought that it went to another agency for the prosecution. Of and, and the expressions that you would typically see with things like the case went to court. Uh, and it was, you know, and I now know, because I've, I've poured all over this and I've checked all the figures, that about a third went down that route, but two-thirds were the post office taking the decision to prosecute themselves. 
We're going to come to that part of evidence yeah. shortly. Yeah. You now know that whilst you were a non-executive director and managing director, um, that the post office alleged to be the victim of crimes, it investigated those crimes itself and decided uh, whether to prosecute. I do, yes. Do you accept that a company's involvement in prosecution such as that um, inherently creates risk for the company? Yes, I, th I, I think it must. What do you think those risks are? Well, I think uh, if, if somewhere that is not the organisation in question is making the call to... Um, it's all about independence. It's making the call to prosecute, um, then one would go into that with a greater degree of comfort. It doesn't mean that the, the case would, would be won or lost. It, it just means that there was probably a higher bar to be cleared before a prosecution was initiated. Now, a lot of the evidence in these cases was on the face of it uh, quite compelling, but that's not really the point. The point is uh, how much independence is there in the, in the thought process. You, you say you weren't aware of a post office's um, position as decide, making decisions on whether to prosecute. Assuming you had been in while you were managing director, the risks you've described, would you have foreseen those at the time? I, I, th I, would, have, I would have been uncomfortable because I would not have encountered that before. So I would have probed the principle and you know, it would be hypothetical for me to say what, what might have happened, but, but it's an area that I would have gone down to say, well, how then, how then do we, are we comfortable that we're doing this? And if, if the power is, is the power, what level of independence could we build into that decision-making process um, inside the post office? So you know, the post office had many strands to it. Uh, I don't know whether this was the case, but I would have, at the very least, looked for line manager sign-off, you know, in the operations area rather than the legal area. So it should be something that just legal would would do. Um, but that's that's all hypothetical, probably not, yes. not helpful, to be honest. Well, let's turn to look at your actual knowledge and what you say in your witness statement. Um, can we go to page twenty-one, please, of the statement? And paragraph 59 talks about the Risk and Compliance Committee. And about five lines down, you say, to the best of my knowledge, the Risk and Compliance Committee was not given any information or reporting, nor did it have any oversight of the prosecution of SPMs. As a result, I did not take any steps as a member of the Risk and Compliance Com Committee to ensure that Paul was acting in compliance with its legal obligations in relation to those prosecutions and civil proceedings against SPMs. I was not aware that they were taking place. Correct. The way you say you were not aware they were taking place, what precisely do you mean? It, it's probably not sufficiently precise. I, I knew there were prosecutions, but prosecutions by the post office, as opposed to from somewhere else, was, was what I was talking about. So what did you think happened in terms of what, who did, who did you think did the investigation? Oh, the post office investigation, there was an investigations team, they did the investigation, and as I said, expressions were used like, this is going to court. I, I had assumed that the police stroke DPP had been involved. I, I mean, I shouldn't have presumed, but I, but I did presume, sadly, and, um, and that we were then, it, it, was, it had gone to court, was the expression they used. I had not encountered um, the notion of an organisation that could make that decision on its own. And uh, I suppose I had too much assumed knowledge and you know, when you see the words that were written, I can see why I still, that view still perpetuated in my mind, because it didn't overtly say, we have taken the decision to prosecute. So, um, one, of, one of my regrets, that I didn't pick up on that earlier. 
Well, as I understand it, it follows from what you're saying that when you became the managing director, no one within the company, Post Office Limited, thought it necessary to tell you, and by the way, we prosecute people in the sense that we don't just investigate them, but we initiate and conduct the prosecution. Is that, is that it? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. And, and it may be that they assumed I knew that. Well, there yeah. may have been many assumptions, but, but that's the state... Yeah, that, that's, that, that was... The, as far as your evidence is concerned, yeah. Yes, that's right. That was, that was the point I was trying to get across. It's quite subtle, and, but, but it's, it's very important. Well, can we look, please, at uh, the... Well, poll 30021418. This is uh, a note of the Risk and Compliance Committee uh, meeting on the 29th of September 2005. You'll see at the bottom your apologies, which means you, were, you weren't in attendance. Correct. Do you remember reading these minutes? Uh, I don't. I mean, this was uh, 18 years ago, whatever. I, I don't remember. I, I'm, I'm sure I would have been uh, sent them. I did not typically, while I was a non-exec, I did not typically attend this risk and compliance meeting. Um, and uh, I didn't realize I was, I mean, obviously I must have had the minutes, but I didn't realize I was being recorded as not in attendance, but I would have received the papers, I'm sure. And would you have read them? Yes. I'm a voracious reader, so. Could we please turn to page six? And the bottom of the page, please. Hmm. Under updates on major incidents, it says Post Office Limited has a principle of undertaking criminal prosecutions for all cases where it is in the public interest, but noting that likelihood of recovery and circumstances of the defendants and victims may be relevant to that decision. That's saying in terms that the Post Office made decisions to prosecute, isn't it? it? It does. It's not how I read it. This is this is my regret. I mean, there was a, I don't know, there was a sort of uh, high and mighty uh, tone some, sometimes there, and people, uh, I don't know, it fed a sense of self-importance. It never occurred to me, reading that, that the post office was the sole arbiter of whether or not that criminal prosecution would proceed. I felt what they were saying was, we agree it's proceeding, but, but somewhere else had to, had to agree to it going ahead. Where did you, where did you get that as assumption from, that it was somewhere I, else? I, I had never come across a situation before where a, a trading entity could initiate criminal prosecutions themselves. So I, I'm, not, um, I'm not blaming others for this. It's my misunderstanding, but I, I just not encountered uh, that type of situation. And I would have just read those uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the vein of, we agree it should be done. Um, Do you think you should have known that post office was making those decisions? I think I, think I should, yes. I, I, and that's, uh, clearly there are many regrets on, on many aspects of this, uh, but but um, that, that is one of mine, that I, I didn't understand. Uh, I was going to call it a subtlety. That would be an insult. It's not a subtlety. It's really important. But it was, it was a, a, a different nuance on it. Could we please turn to Paul three zeros two one four two one? This is another Risk and Compliance Committee meeting on the 6th of September 2006. At this point, we see that you're uh, in attendance as a member. Because I was then the managing director, yeah. 
I think uh, Sir Mike Hodgkinson talked yesterday about the debate about the appropriateness of me being there or not as an executive, but I felt quite strongly um, that this would be a, a committee that I should attend as, as managing director. And why was that? Um, it's something I've done in all the companies that I've chaired or been involved in since. Uh, I always go to the Risk and Compliance Committee because that's where a lot of the detail is. And putting it crudely, that's where the risks lie. And I've always worked, um, I've always worked in regulated businesses. So uh, the word compliance is, is quite important because you're, you're working to a set of statutory rules for many of the different products that we were selling. Um, and so compliance with those rules feels like a really important thing for the, for the boss to have his head round. Could we turn, please, to page four? And go to the bottom of the document. It says investigation activity report... Uh, sorry, investigation activity period five report... And it refers to Dave Pardo presenting the key points from the monthly investigation team. Do you recall who Dave Pardo was? Um, well, I assume he was a member of the investigation. I've recognised the name, but I, I can't see him in my mind's eye, and, uh, and I assume he was on the investigation team. I, I, I don't know. And what did you think the investigation team did? Well, they investigated uh, all aspects of fraud and just to, just to make it plain more more cash went through the post office organization than any other organization you know 80 billion a year um, the potential for fraud was endless but the fraud I'm talking about is what the customers were up to uh, not particularly about what what staff were up to um, so there was uh, there was a constant stream these investigation reports would have a whole range of issues um, you know, for example, I don't know, uh, travel money cards or we were issuing cash on plastic, which seemed a very uh, innovative thing at the time, believe it or not, considering how we all behave today. But there was, there was a lot of uh, uh, potential fraud to investigate. But you, you knew that the, they investigated uh, allegations of fraud within sub-post offices? Yes, yes. And or even even in crown post offices or franchise yes. offices, yeah, yeah. And did you know that was part of this security team? Yes. And what was your, in terms of reporting lines, what was your relationship to the security team? Uh, they reported through uh, the operations director. Um, I, I can't remember how many layers, but ultimately. Um, the operations director was responsible for that and the operations director reported to me. And did you ever have discussions with members of the security team outside of the risk and compliance meeting? I, I, would, have, I would have thought so. If, if, you, if you're going to follow up with a question of and what was one of those meetings, I would struggle to remember, to be honest. But um, I, was, um, I was quite a visible boss, I think, and so I would make it my business if, if it was possible, if somebody had written me something from inside the organisation, uh, my tendency um, would be to get up and go and find that person and talk to them about it. Uh, and that, that visibility, I think, was good that I was always walking around the building on the days that I wasn't out in the network. Um, to, and, and then you connect better with people. So I'm sure I had contact, but I, I couldn't give you an example, to be frank. But with that visibility and, and the likelihood of talking to them, your evidence is still that at no point in the years that you were a managing director, anyone in the security or investigation team raised the fact that they made decisions to prosecute. I, I th well, well, that is my position, definitely. Um, I, I think it's sometimes what's said and what's heard. And the problem that I was bringing to the piece was I just had a presumption and I didn't hear something sufficiently categoric to say, what, you mean we decide on our own and no one can stop us? I never asked that question. Well, no, when I say I never asked, I did obviously when we got to the Computer Weekly article, which we'll get to, but, but prior to that point, I had, I had gone through 
not picking up that. And I'm not blaming them for not spelling it out enough. I'm, I'm to be frank, I'm blaming me for not picking up on it. So you, people can say things and they feel that's okay, he was okay with that. Well, I wasn't okay with it, I just didn't really appreciate what was meant. Can we bring the same document back up, please? It was um, P-O-L, ah, thank you. Uh, it's still on page four, please. It goes on to say what was in the report. It says, in, in particular, the report focused on the Accrington DMB, that's directly managed branch, is it? Yes, yep. Of a £600,000 fraud. Successes using proceeds of Crime Act. Um, what does that mean to you? Uh, I don't really know, to be honest. Um, well, was it the case that you were discussing the Post Office Limited using the proceeds of Crime Act to I recover? Yes. So I, I, if, that's, if that's coded speak for Post Office making prosecutions, then... Then, then so be it. That's not necessarily what I read it as. That's not what I'm putting to you. I'm, oh, I'm okay. putting to you yep. that that is, um, refers to a discussion of Post Office Limited using the proceeds of Crime Act to recover funds yep. from persons it's um, accusers of theft or fraud. Oh, OK, yeah. That's would nice. that have happened? Would that conversation have happened? Well, it, it's in a report that I would have received... Um, we know you were at, you were at this meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't remember the conversation, obviously, all that time ago. But um, uh, and it says, and the better targeting of audit resource on dishonest branches. Dishonest branches. That's referring to sub postmasters accused of theft, fraud, and false accounting, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes. Well, I. I don't think it's just sub postmasters, but you know, if there's if there were problems with a branch, there were many there were many different types of branches. I mean, a significant quantity of the branches were franchised um, <coughs> to supermarket chains and high street retails. You know, so there were there was a, a group of directly managed branches where the staff in them worked for me. There was a large tranche of branches that were partnerships with other retail yes. organisations, and then there were some postmasters. Yes. Um, before we move on, the second paragraph on 3.2 refers to concerns about cheques as an appropriate method of payment. Um, it says, likewise, issues were raised with the Instant Saver Access Saver account and travel cards offers in themselves solid offers that are spoilt by branch non-conformance. It says, Alan voiced an opinion that he was against modifying an offer to the detriment of the customer in order, to force a brand, in order to force branch conformance and would rather expect steps be taken to drive conformance by sanction if necessary. Yeah. What sanction um, is that referring to? That doesn't really sound like me, but, um, yeah, it, it would be... If we would just... If we had to stop... And don't forget, cheques were still a big thing back then. If we had to stop taking cheques because we had people that couldn't handle the cheque correctly, um, that seemed disadvantageous to customers. So what we needed to do was to find a way of making sure that we followed the right procedures. Now, very often, I have to say, that the challenge was the procedure was cumbersome in the first place. So... It is harder to conform if the process is complicated. So, uh, so this was, uh, I spent many years in customer operations. It's the line I grew up in. And, and, and you, can, you can engineer these problems out by changing processes and procedures. And you can't make them foolproof, but you can design, if you're not careful, processes that make it more likely that people will make mistakes. And I did. One of the things I did as part of my induction when I became managing director rather than chief exec was I, I did the uh, Horizon, Horizon the, the fast version of the Horizon training course. 
and I went and worked at my local Crown office for a day, which was probably one of my most stressful days yes, at well, the post office. But, but it, it showed to me that it's a, it was a complicated thing to do. OK. Um, I want to show you another document, please. It's poll 3048361. And this was a document that was given to you this morning. Oh, right, yes. So this is investigation team report period 9, December 2006. In the top left, it says Paul E.T. That's the Post Office Limited executive team, isn't it? Yes, yes. And these are the types of reports we were referring to in the last set of minutes, Correct. which would yeah. be sent to you. Yeah, yeah. And you see in the, in the top right, it says it's from uh, Tony Utting with the job title National Investigation Manager. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember working with uh, Mr Utting? I, I don't, to be honest. I, I, I recognise the name. It depends what you mean by I remember working with him. I, I, I knew the name, but I, I can't place him now after all these years. When Mr Utting gave evidence to the inquiry, uh, he said that he had acted... Uh, as designated prosecuting authority to make uh, decisions on prosecutions. Right. I assume you can't agree or disagree with that. No, I, I, that's the first I've heard of it, yep. If we look down below the, or the investigation, it says investigation team report, um, the, the title there, and it says beneath that, uh, the principal aims of the investigation team are to stop criminal offences taking place, apprehend and prosecute those who commit offences against us in order to maximise our recovery and reduce loss to po uh, Post Office Limited and its clients through the identification of areas of weakness. It goes on. Yeah. Again, this is saying in terms that Post Office Limited prosecutes people, isn't yeah. it? No, no. It's, it, it's, it's the same point. I, I, I do understand and accept the point. I still didn't take out of it that we were the final decider in so many cases to prosecute. I mean, this report just, um, I saw it this morning, just reminds me the, the scale of activity in an organisation that handles so much cash. So there's so many things going on here if you look about different types of product, the, the risk of fraud, um, uh, and primarily to me, when I was hearing the word fraud, I was thinking it was we or the Bank of Ireland was being defrauded by customers. Uh, and, you know, very often it was, but uh, there was another dimension, which was staff as well. Well, if we, if we turn to page three, please. Um, and the second paragraph, I, I say you, I'm sure I'm going to, to get this wrong. Um, I think it's the uh, Gearwin Post Office branch. You can see a wry smile. I probably have got that wrong. But uh, anyway, um, it's, uh, th this is, refers to the prosecution of um, Noel Thomas, uh, a core participant in these proceedings. And it said the sub-postmaster pleaded guilty to false accounting by inflating his cash account by approximately £48,000. It goes on to uh, describe the case. You would have seen this at the time, wouldn't you? Yes. So and the screen's just gone blank, actually. Yes, it's, it's, it's oh, okay. just... Oh, OK. Yeah, right. And £48,000, that's a significant loss to the business, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And the idea of these investigation reports is that you get them on a monthly basis. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. yeah. And it enables the executive team to trace through from the point of a loss is found right through to the outcome of the case. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. It, is it not the case that whilst this case was going through and you received um, updates on it, at some point 
you would have been told that a decision had been made to prosecute? Well, I, I think not really. I, I, I don't think that's the case. These cases were reported on, and if they went, and as I said, the, the terminology, and it's even used in that particular paper, went to court. Uh, it, it, well, they went to court, didn't they? Even yes. if the post office made the decision, the case went to court. Yeah, well, those two things don't quite go together. So it went to court. I had not assumed that we had made, we might have wanted it to go to court, but I didn't realise that we had the power back then to take it to court, regardless of what anybody else might think. If, if Post Office Limited had been dealing with the CPS or the police mm. to, to uh, handle these um, types of cases, would that have been described within Post Office Limited that CPS was a stakeholder? Well, about 30% of them went down that route, I now understand. That wasn't my... Oh, okay. But I, I never saw a differentiation. Nobody ever... You know, it wasn't who decided. Is it, it went to court. And, and as I say, I, I, I now understand. I sat and worked it out the other evening. that Just under 30% went that route. So, so the majority were the post office making that call. But I had not appreciated that at the time until late in 2009. Well, we'll come to late in 2009 yeah. shortly. Um, how do you think that prosecutions were overseen in post office? By the investigations team. And so is it effectively that, what is your evidence effectively that the investigation team and the security team maybe ran the investigations, but at board level, there was no oversight. Well, it, it reported up through the operations director, um, but we wouldn't have been progressing each case at board level because the organisation was just too large. It just you wouldn't be looking at individual cases if something notable happened, and that. That Welsh one was was notable, I guess, and it it got a it got its whole paragraph. But when I would have read that, I would have seen um, that the the postmaster pleaded guilty. Uh, my concern now, I understand, is is that the postmasters were being advised to plead guilty, even if they thought they weren't, well, in that, order to reduce. We're, we're looking at the decision on on prosecution. Let's let's look yeah, okay. In, Sorry, in, I another way. Yes. Yeah. Um, are you aware that the central legal department in Royal Mail Group um, provided uh, legal advice on the prosecutions? I, I assume they, would, they did, yes. I took comfort from the fact they were there. So you knew that Royal Mail Legal had some involvement? Yes. What did you think they were doing? Well, I, they were... Um, it, it's not an unusual... Uh, governance structure to have a, a large central support function that's providing a service to two or three different business units in a group and one of the uh, and for one of those business units there would be a a more senior person lawyer or accountant or whatever that would establish a close relationship with the business unit but they their their main boss would be the central function. Now, if you're in that business unit, you take some comfort from the fact that there's a more high-power individual in Royal Mail Group that is exercising uh, technical oversight uh, over what those people are doing. But what did you think they were taking oversight of for you to gain any comfort? Uh, the, the quality of the legal decisions being made. The, and what were the legal decisions being made? Well, there was a whole variety of things. We had, you know, f fraud on post office card account, and oh, there was there was loads there was loads of activity going on that was nothing to do with Horizon issues and sub postmasters. Right. So let's focus purely on the decision to prosecute. Yeah. Did you re did you realise that? Oh, so let's make it broader than that. The investigation of sub postmasters for theft fraud and false accounting mm -hmm. and the subsequent prosecution, did you think 
that the Royal Mail Group legal department had any involvement in that? I would have thought they'd have had oversight, yes. Why did you think that? Because they were responsible for the, for the legal function. I'm going to go back to, excuse me, back to the hypothetical um, where you, we started earlier. If you, ha you, if you um, were aware, assume you were aware that Post Office Limited were um, making the decisions to prosecute. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What? Would you have? sought to get legal fun a legal function within Post Office Limited? Well, the latter wasn't an option, because that had been debated when I, when I, first, uh, when I first was offered the role. Um, but uh, I would have, I would have uh, if I had discovered that back then, as I, th I think I've already said, I would have then looked at how we could uh, put safety checks in and whatever, but it would be something that I would have reviewed with the group legal director. With hindsight, do you think relying on the group uh, legal department was effectively putting that advice too high up the chain? Um, well, I think it was a mistake on my part. I, you, you know, I'd, I shouldn't have allowed the organisational structure to give me any sense of less of an accountability because I, I, I was accountable, um, but 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 no, I don't think th th this was this was quite a big deal. I, I I think it would be right and justifiable for me to be talking to the group legal director and and seeking personal assurance from him that he was comfortable with what they were doing. So I'm going to move on to another. Topic. I know it's slightly early, but I wonder if we, it, it might be more sensible to have a, a break there and then have a longer break until we swap. Yeah, well, uh, however you wish to pursue it, uh, Mr. Stevens. So what time should we start again? Uh, 25 to. Fine. Thank you. Sir, so can you see and hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. I... I um, I apologise, I'm going to have to go back to the topic I was just covering. Um, we've given a new document uh, to Mr Cook, which he hasn't, um, I don't think, seen before, at least not, um, and I shouldn't say that, hasn't seen recently. Um, can I turn that up now, please? It's WITN 01870101. Sorry, the seven should have been a two. My apologies. Uh, and we could, could we go to page six, please? Mr. Cook, you, this is a letter dated 3rd September 2008 um, to Mr. Sabbath. Have you seen this recently? Yeah, five minutes ago, yeah. Um, if we can go to the uh, end of the letter, please, on the other page. It says, yours sincerely, uh, and then we've redacted that, um, but it says Alan Cook. Did you sign this letter? I would assume so, yeah. Could we go, please, back to page one? Oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, it's pa page six. I meant page one of the letter. That's very misleading of me. Uh, could we go to the bottom, please? Thank you. So it's referring to previous correspondence about disputed accounting errors. It refers to um, audits and identified shortages uh, totaling £50,000, so £50,619.17, and an outstanding recovery. The last paragraph says, in terms of the decision to issue court proceedings, 
the investigations undertaken by the post office security team are to decide whether there is a criminal case to answer. The, this is independent from any action that may be taken by the contracts team, whose role is to focus on contractual related issues only. I believe that Carol Bell and contracts manager has made this differentiation quite clear during one of the several conversations she's had with you over the past uh, few months. It gives me no pleasure to write a letter such as this. I'm truly sorry for any impact this situation may have on your family. Um, at the same time, I am mindful of the cash and stock we're accountable for, uh, for our public funds. The decision to issue legal proceedings is never taken lightly. The alleged offence of fraud against you are, however, of a sufficiently serious nature to support that this is the correct course of action to take. A decision, therefore, uh, remains unchanged. This shows, doesn't it, that you were aware that it was the post office security team that made decisions on whether or not there was a criminal case to answer? Well, this is a another example of, of the same thing. That is not how I, how I read it. And it, we would never, clearly, we wouldn't have wanted anyone prosecuted where we didn't believe we wanted to prosecute, but I didn't believe that we were the only party that made that possible. If you Mr. Cook, right. before you sign letters, you presumably satisfy yourself that they're yeah. accurate. Yeah. Well, I, I, it, it's how it's how I read it at the time. Yeah, so I you, do. You yes. satisfy yourself they're accurate. Yeah. And how did you do that? In how, how would you have done that in this case? There would have been there would have been a file of papers with this, typically. So there would have there would have been uh, was I forget the beginning. Was this responding to a, a letter from Mr. Sabit? Yes. Can't remember. Yes. So there would have been his letter, a report from the relevant part of the organisation and this letter to sign. And they would have drafted the letter. Over the course of working there for a number of years in responding to this letter, you would have known, wouldn't you, that Post Office Limited made the decision to prosecute in some cases? I, I didn't appreciate it was their sole decision. I, clearly, we would have to have decided it wanted to happen, but I still felt that it wasn't the post office's power to do so. So it, it's the same point that I was making before the, before the break. I'll move on. Um, I want to look at knowledge of Horizon, please. Could we um, take your witness statement at page 8, paragraph 27? <laughs> Paragraph 27 um, talks about knowledge of Horizon as a non-executive director. And I think it's about roughly eight lines down. You say, I recall asking about reliability in terms of system availability and accuracy. What do you mean by system availability and accuracy? Um, in terms of... Uh was it there when it was meant to be there, if you see what I mean? So when the, when the day started, if you turn the thing on, was it available? And, and in fact, later on in my time there, that did become an issue where the system wasn't available. Uh, and a lot of the work of the subsequent development of Horizon was to make it run faster, more efficiently, and definitely finish all its overnight processing before it needed to come up in, in the morning. So that's availability, and then that it all worked and the screens didn't lock and all that sort of stuff. And it produced accurate accounts? Sorry? And it produced accurate accounts? Yes, yes. Okay. But accuracy was a much broader term than just, just the accounts. It was obviously, you know, did it perform correctly? If I'm doing a road tax disc, when I press this button, okay. does it produce the right road tax disc for it? You go on to say, availability seemed to be good, and I was assured at the time that there were no critical bugs or defects. Who assured you? Um, well, I can't name individuals, but when I was doing my rounds, I was in walked, uh, walked, but met with people in the operations area and got demonstrations. Um, certainly, um, 
one of the two David Smiths uh, would have been one of the people that I sat down with, the, the IT guy, uh, to talk me through the, the system, its history, its current level of performance. Um, this, was in a, this was in an environment where um, the accuracy of the system was not really in, in question. Um, but there were issues ab about, as I say, its, its overnight performance and its availability. Could we just go jog on to uh, page 15, please, and paragraph 42? There you say, uh, I've been asked whether I was ever told that there were no systemic issues with Horizon or problem with integrity prior to February 2009. You see, I do not recall being told at any time, whilst a non-executive di director, that there were or were not mm. systemic issues with Horizon or problems with integrity. So is, is, are you talking about something different here to when you said earlier you were assured on its accuracy? Uh, well, no, this, is, uh, this, this was about while I was a NED, so it was the first, the first 12 months that I was involved in the post office and the level of briefing I got as a non-exec was less than I received when I became managing director and I think this paragraph is talking about was I told whether or not there were systemic issues it was a problem that didn't come up in my briefing so you you were told it was accurate is that is that right For well what, what I was saying there was that, that accuracy was not flagged as an issue Right. Yeah. So uh, effectively, accuracy and integrity were, when you were a NED were a, a non-issue. Assumed to be okay. Yes. That can, document can come down. Thank you. Could we please bring up poll three zeros two one four eight seven? This is a minute of the board meeting of Post Office Limited on the 23rd of February 2005. And that was your first board meeting you attended as a non-executive director, wasn't it? Yes, it must have been, yeah. Um, looking at the attendance list, who there was responsible or had expertise in IT? Um, so, well, it, it would... Rick Francis as the operations. Rick director. Francis. Yeah. So people like David Smith that I referred to a moment ago worked for Rick Francis. Uh, on the meeting was David Miller as well, Chief yeah. Operating Officer. What did you know of his background? Um, well, I, I, I'd never met him before I joined. He'd been at the post office for many, many years and seemed to be the the, f the font of all knowledge, you see what I mean, seemed a respected guy. Um, when I arrived, um, well, when I, this is, a, sorry, this is when I'm a non-exec, that's right. Um, so he was the chief operating officer. By the time I was uh, approached to join, he'd indicated his decision to retire. So I didn't really work with him as an executive, but I did work with him. You it, said he was the, the font of all knowledge. Yeah. Uh, did that include on Horizon? Um, well, he, he wasn't, I don't think he was an IT specialist, but, but he would have had all the history. You know, he was, uh, yeah, he was a knowledgeable guy. Were you aware he was heavily involved in the pilot of Horizon? I wasn't specifically, no. It wouldn't surprise me, but I, I didn't know that. Could we turn, please, to um, page six? And if we could go down uh, so that, that's perfect, thank you. Now this is a discussion on Horizon Next Generation, which we've been calling Horizon Online. I, I don't want to cover Horizon Online now. I want to look at F, where it says assurance was provided to the board that mm. the new system would have at least a similar standard of current capability. Um, do you recall there being any discussion 
on the adequacy of what's called Legacy Horizon, the model of Horizon that was running at the time? No, my, my, obviously this was my first meeting, but my, my impression was there was a level of contentment with the functionality of the system, uh, but not its running cost and occasionally its availability. So I believe this uh, next generation proposal was about making it cheaper and faster to run. When you make it faster, you make it cheaper. But, um, and so the guarantee that was being given was that it wouldn't reduce the level of capability. There'd be no point in making it run faster and cheaper if, in fact, there were things that we used to be able to do that we couldn't do anymore. Was there anyone on the board asking probing questions as to the capability or the adequacy of the systems? Well, my impression attending this board meeting, um, uh, uh, my very first one, was that we were treading ground that everybody in the room had already discussed apart from me. Um, because the vast majority of people on that meeting were the management team. So I'm sure they would have debated it before it, it came in. So if there was challenge within the management team, I, I didn't see it. That didn't mean it didn't happen at an earlier meeting. But the only people I suspect that were looking at this at that meeting for the first time would have been, I assume, I can't remember the attendees, but Mike Hodgkinson I assume would have been there uh, myself and Brian Goggin, if he was there, would be the only people that were seeing it for the first time. You see what I mean? And was it not precisely your role as a non-executive director to challenge the? It was. It was. It was my. You? It was my first meeting. I can't. I can't remember what I, what I asked, but uh, I remember, and I've commented in my uh, witness statement that um, one of the things I would have imagined I would have commented on is that if you're trying to make the system run faster and more slickly, it is quite dangerous to try and start changing the functionality at the same time. Right? Because the way you test it is to produce, does this run faster, che cheaper and quicker, and does it give you the same answer? If you start changing the functionality at the same time, it makes interpreting the test results more difficult. Now, of course, the problem is that relies on the fact that you are comfortable with the functionality that is already in place. So it, it, any counsel I would have offered would have been uh, on the assumption that the system functionality was sufficient, was that we should try not to change the system functionality and, fo and focus on th the real objective, which was to get the thing to run faster and cheaper. Please can we turn to poll 3021420. It's another risk and compliance meeting, uh, 22nd of March, 2006. So you would have been managing director at that point? By, by a few days, yes. The conversation about me uh, being a regular attender took place between this meeting and, and the next one, and the next one is the one you've already showed us as, as me being present. But yes, I was not present at this one. So you're not present, but again, you would have read the minutes? I'm sure, yeah. Well, definitely, because... Um, I was in post by then. Yeah. Um, could we turn to page eight, please, I, I believe? Yeah, page eight. There's an appendix to this concerning um, the impact program, uh, which the acquirers had significant amounts of evidence on. Uh, it says impact and the Pulse accounting system has m moved on significantly since the last report to the Risk and Compliance Committee. The system is not yet processing all transactions correctly, and so the end state of the Pulse ledgers, which automatically interface to the main business account, has not yet been achieved. Do you recall reading that, or, and can you tell us what your views on it were? I, I don't remember specifically. I, I, I can't. I can't interpret from that. Is that something that's in a testing phase, or is it something that's meant to be in production? Well, I mean, the, the, if you, do you remember what your views? No, no. no I'm, what I'm saying is, my, I, I don't remember what I might have said. Well, I didn't say anything because obviously I wasn't at the meeting. But if I read that, I would be. My first question would be, I can't tell from that paragraph 
whether this is something that's in production and being used or it's results of testing that they're working on because it talks about uh, it's moved on significantly since the last report sort of implies that these are test test results but i don't know so you would have needed to follow up with uh, yeah yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't have understood that We'll move on to a different topic, please. Um, POL 3081928. If we could turn to page 13, please. And if we could go to the email at the bottom, please. Thank you. So it's it, there. That, that's perfect. Thanks. Because we see it's one of these very unhelpful email um, print offs where uh, we see that it's to Sean Turner on the 11th of January 2006. <coughs> Subject calendar square. Over the page. Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah. It says that a sub postmaster has reported that he is again experiencing problems with transfers, 5th January 2006, which resulted in a loss of around £43,000, which has subsequently rectified itself. I know that the sub postmaster has reported this to Horizon Support, who have come back to him stating they cannot find any problem. If we could then turn to Page six, please. If we can go down to the second email in the chain. Thank you. This is an email the inquiry has seen before. It's from Anne Chambers to Mike Stewart, um, both within uh, Fujitsu. And it refers to the same issue, Calendar Square. Second paragraph says, I haven't looked at the recent event evidence, but I know in the past this site had hit the repost lock problem two or three times within a few weeks. This problem has been around for years and affects a number of sites most weeks. And finally, Escher say they have done something about it. I'm interested in whether they really have fixed it, which is why I left the call open to remind me to check over the whole estate once S90 is live. So this is a problem that appears to have caused a discrepancy, of, a significant discrepancy. Mm -hmm. And these are both Fujitsu people, you say? The, these are yeah. Fujitsu yeah. people, yes. Yeah. But you accept it's a problem that's caused a significant discrepancy? Well, I, I, I don't know. I've only, I'm just reading this. I assume it must have done. I've never heard of the repost lock problem before. Um, well, let me put it this way. If there was a problem which had the potential to cause a discrepancy of over £40,000. Um, oh, I see, because it relates to the email. Yes, OK. Yeah. And it had been around for years, affects a number of sites most weeks. That's a significant concern, isn't it? Yeah. I, I don't know if that problem is the same as the discrepancy, but... It's, it's the same email. As I say, it's, or we see at the top, calendar all, square. All I'm saying is I don't know if that has produced I see. The, the discrepancy. Um, if you can go up in the chain, please. Oh, sorry, I'm uh, just to the top of, uh, if you can go down a little bit, please. That's perfect, thank you. Um, that email is forwarded by Mike Stewart to Lynn Fallowfield, who's at post office. It says, Lynn, I was waiting for an update on the calendar square. See the email chain below. Um, and goes on to say, I think I'm inclined as per this issue to wait and see if all these branches are okay after the S90 counter roll starts forth after the pilot this week. And that document can come down for the moment. Uh, were you aware of, well, you said you weren't aware of the repost lock issue. Yeah. Were you ever aware of an issue at Calendar Square when you were managing director? No, I don't, rec well, I don't recall. I don't recall. Could we... Please bring up poll three zeros three two two one zero. It's a 
board meeting on the 20th of April 2006. Um, if you could just get, get the entire attendance list in there, please. So looking down that, in terms of IT people, you earlier identified Rick Francis. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who had an IT background there? Uh, not, it doesn't seem to be anybody that works for Rick, that worked for Rick, that is in the in attendance list. So, no, I don't think so. Can we go to page 10, please? And down to the operations report section. It says Horizon S90 release. So we saw in the, do you remember, we saw in the last email, it says that the problem would be fixed with S90. Yeah, yeah. It says this release would, and it lists an, a number of things it would do. One, transfer bureau debit credit card transactions, more to do with debit and credit cards, some generic payments. And then four, provide for a plethora of change requests across a variety of existing capabilities. Uh, what, did the board interrogate what those changes would be? Well, I, I, I can't remember, but that, that, that would be something I would normally challenge. You know, a, a plethora of change requests is, uh, you get great detail on the first three, and I'm sure they're bigger, uh, and I'm sure those things will be individually smaller, but if it's a plethora of them, to use the word, then that suggest, suggests it would require probing. But I don't, I, don't, I don't recall the conversation. I'm just reading it cold here. But. Well, based on your, how the minutes were created at Post Office Limited, mm -hmm. if there had been challenges, would they have been recorded in the minutes? I'd have hoped so. So do I take it from that that, well, what is your evidence? Do you, th do you think that it was challenged or it wasn't? Well, it, it, there's no evidence of it being challenged. That's, that's Why wouldn't opinion. it have been challenged? I, I don't know. I, there could have been some reassuring words when the, when the thing was presented that, that saw off uh, challenge, and this is how the person doing the minutes chose to summarise the conversation. But, I mean, I, I literally do not remember the conversation. Uh, and, um, but there is clearly no documentary evidence that that fourth bullet was probed. Do you think if there was a non-exec on the board with, with IT experience, that might have been challenged, or is yes. more likely to have been challenged? Yes. And, and, and interestingly, in, in roles more recently, it's become much more common for, um, for IT um, senior or sort of or recently retired senior IT people to join boards of all sorts of businesses. So I chaired a small bank and we had an IT professional on the board. It was always a struggle for him because he wasn't a banker. But actually he was there because he was an IT person and provided useful independent challenge. But there was no such person on the board at this time other than employees. Executive members. Yes, executives, yeah. that's right. Did yes. you feel sufficiently able to challenge the executive? Um, d d I felt able to challenge the executive to, um, to a, a level that was comparable with, with my experience, but I wasn't purporting to be an expert in every functional activity. So I had a, a, a bias in my personal background which said I was, I was an operations type guy in my early years, not IT, but, you know, processing operations. Um, I've spent all my time in financial services, and, uh, and they were all the reasons why people felt I would be worth having on the board, but um, I wouldn't be able to, and I did, actually, for a period at the Prudential run um, uh, responsible for IT, um, but I had a, an IT director supplied by Accenture that reported to me. So I, was, I would have been a detailed specialist. Um, At any point did you ask for 
more support with IT uh, to be able to be able to challenge the executive in a more adequate way. Well, the, the, the point was that the, the there wasn't an appetite to have other non-execs on the Post Office Limited Board, and we did have the Group IT Director sitting on the Royal Mail Holdings Board. And as I said, what was happening was these these things were going up to Royal Mail Holdings Board, and there was more challenge available there. There was a Group Legal Director, there was a Group IT Director, and whilst they were employees, they weren't branded just Post Office. So there was a level of independence in their in interrogation. And I don't think, um, I have to say I, I didn't ask, but I didn't ask because I didn't expect the organisation would want me to be looking for independent non-execs to go on the Post Office Limited Board. Let's just stand back a, a bit. The Horizon obviously records transactions for the post office business, yes? Sorry, say that again. Horizon records transactions records. for the post office business. Yes. And it provided the data uh, from which the statutory and management accounts would be compiled. Yeah. Um, and as a director, you had to have confidence in that data to be able to sign off on the management and statutory accounts. Yep. So it follows, does it not, that you needed to be in a position to satisfy yourself that the IT system that generated the data was sufficiently robust and, and reliable? Correct. And, and one of the ways any board would get that level of comfort is from the external auditors. And the external auditors would come in and they would run software against the the system that was you know, the, the, the primary driver of the business and would run their own reconciliations to make sure, does it add up this way, did I say it, and does it add up that way, and does the answer come the same, and they would have run, and it's sort of proprietary software that's used by auditing firms to validate the financial integrity of a system that they're auditing. That, that type of audit has the concept of materiality, doesn't it? Yes, it would. Do you want to, ex could you just explain what that is? So it, it wouldn't have to reconcile to the penny, um, but it would have to, uh, you know, the, but we're not talking about the penny in these instances here, are we? Would, you know, it's, um, so, uh, so you would, you should, it's a pretty reliable way of proving whether or not a system is reconciling. That works, as you say, for statutory accounts. In terms of yeah. the sub-postmaster who may be facing a... Oh, no, I, I was just answering your question about No, no, I'm just, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm asking another one. Yeah, OK, um, yeah, I agree, I agree, in, yes. It, it doesn't help the sub-postmaster who... If, may... if you're the rounding error, right, that's no joke, right? So it, every single one needs to work. Um, because there could be compensating errors, for example. Was anyone on the board thinking of the reliability of the Horizon IT system from that perspective, the sub-postmaster's perspective? I, I, I think Rick Francis was focused on his user community. I, I, he wouldn't have been thinking just about sub-postmasters. He'd have been thinking about all people, all types of branch that used Horizon to, to process transactions. There were two audiences, really. What did Horizon feel like for the person on the counter that was performing the transaction, who might actually work for a sub-postmaster, but also what did it feel like for the customer, who's the other side of the counter, receiving whatever you know, it, it is they're purchasing. So that's Rick Francis. In terms of you as the managing director, um, did you think about it from the sub-postmaster's perspective? Of yes, how I did. Yeah, I, I had, um, it's only a slight digression, but, but certainly when I arrived, uh, I, I felt the, uh, the, the sub-postmaster community felt uh, unloved to a degree by Post Office Limited. And one of, the, uh, one of my early objectives was to try and get close to the sub-postmaster community uh, and, I, and try and resolve that. Uh, one of the first things I did was establish a strong relationship with the chap who was then the Federation's uh, top guy and, and the top team. And I started... Can you just say for clarity, can you give a name, please? Uh, Colin Baker, his name was, yeah, sorry. Um, and, um, and then I started uh, a programme of visits, which in the end I did for the entire three years and ten months that I was there, of, of, of going out. Um, and I would... Uh, 
on a Friday, and I would pick a part of the country, and then I would say to the Fed, and I would say to the regional manager in the area, uh, I've got time to visit five branches. Give me a list of branches that I can go and visit. And, and I went um, randomly visited them. Um, that was the biggest source of information. Oh, and, and just to be plain, it wasn't just sub, sub postmasters as I visited Crown offices and franchise branches as well. But that was uh, my attempt to keep my feet on the ground as to what the organisation was thinking and worrying about. And uh, for those sub postmasters in the room, your guess, I got plenty of feedback. Right? And on, but, on please, that, just if I, yeah, if I may, sorry. Um, you say in your statement you think you visited about 250 yeah, yeah. branches over a period of years. Um, without criticising, I'm not criticising the effort, but in terms of getting feedback from how users uh, found the Horizon IT system, that was a very, very small proportion of the number of users using it, wasn't it? Well, all the numbers in the post office are very large, right? So you, 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 you do what you can do. Um, all I can say is that I, I found the visits illuminating. I can remember being in one uh, village that will be nameless and the sub-postmistress sub -post took me back into her kitchen behind the shop and went through the process of how car insurance was sold yeah. and why she couldn't be bothered to sell it because of the tortuous process well, that was followed, following which we changed it. Yeah, well, let... So those are individual... Was there anything else you did other than those visits to try to understand how sub-postmasters found the Horizon IT system? Um, well, I wasn't just talking about the Horizon IT system. I was talking about the, the business as no, a whole. My question is about just the Horizon IT well, system. Well, my primary focus was on the Federation. So I, I used the Federation as, you know, the, the, the mouthpiece of sub-postmasters to provide input. Um, and then there was a... There was in, on, on the staff, there was someone that ran the Crown offices, so I looked at the Federation, the Crown offices, and the franchise branches. So, but during, just so I've got this clear, during your period as, as managing director, you had your 250 or so visits uh, to branches themselves, and then in terms of further sub-postmaster feedback, that was effectively filtered through the NFSP? Yes, yes, I, I, I filtered sounds a bit harsh but yes it, yes well sorry it, it, it came it, through the it, it came through the nfsp um they were you know they were always forthright vociferous um friendly it wasn't it wasn't uh, antagonistic uh, colin baker in particular went out of his way right, to to welcome me into the family if you see what i mean we my wife and i used to go to federation dinners and all this sort of stuff it was important to me to get close to the community that was uh, servicing our customers. While we're on this, I, I want to come to um, what the inquiry is uh, termed as, as responding to the emerging scandal. Um, can we please look at poll 00027890? This is a letter, uh, you've in your statement described it as the Porteous letter. It's sent, we see the top right, um, it's Pat McFadden MP, then Minister for Employment Relations and Postal yep. Affairs. And it includes correspondence from Brian Binley at MP, who in turn includes um, a, an email from Rebecca Thompson. Yep. Can we look at the email, please? Uh, it's page three, I believe. So it's an email dated uh, 10th February 2009, but as I said before, you only receive it on 7th of May, yeah. uh, according to the stamp refers to speaking to several current and former sub-postmasters uh, who say that random flaws in the IT are causing deficits in their weekly accounts, sometimes thousands of pounds at a time. 
uh, the complaint is that instead of listening to their problems and investigating the software equipment, the post office is making them pay back this money without any investigation into what is going wrong. And it continues as such. Do you recall receiving this and reading it? Oh, yes. Well, this, this was the moment, right? Now, I'm, strangely, I saw the article from Computer Weekly before I saw this, um, only because, as you remarked, the, the, the letter was date-stamped in 7th of May. Um, it went out with a deadline. If anything came in from Pat McFadden, it was dealt with quick for me to reply about a week later. But in that week... Um, the Computer Weekly article came out. So it was, we're only talking a couple of days, yep. but the reality is I saw the Computer Weekly article before I saw this correspondence. And actually, I didn't particularly put the two together because my head was uh, full of the Computer Weekly article. Yes, we'll come, come to that shortly. Yeah. That, that um, email can come down. Uh, at paragraph 27... Um, uh, sorry, paragraph 79 page 27 of your witness statement. It doesn't need to be turned up. Uh, you say that when you received that letter, you uh, indicated to Michelle Graves, ex Executive Correspondence Manager, that you would like the matter thoroughly investigated. Yep. Can we Sorry, look yeah. then at the Computer Weekly article now, please? That is POL 3041564. So this is from, um, it's a, as you say, the article is by Rebecca Thompson in Computer Weekly. If we could uh, go down slightly, please. Thank you. And it refers to the case of Lee Castleton. And, well, I'll ask this first. Were you aware of Lee Castleton before reading this article? No. It states that there, he, um, he was declared bankrupt after he refused to pay the post office £27,000. Castleton insists he did not owe the money, although it showed as a loss on the post office's horizon system, which is used by postmasters to do their accounting. He is one of several postmasters to come across losses they could not explain. If we could turn over the page, please. The second paragraph says, having lost the case, Castleton was left with costs of £321,000. In 2007, he filed for bankruptcy. Uh, I was in too deep. I see that now. The whole thing has been heartbreaking, he says. Uh, the trial of the, the Castleton trial, the post office v. Castleton, uh, was heard while you were managing director. Apparently you, so, yeah. you say you were unaware of it. I was unaware. £321,000 or money of that amount is a significant debt to be owed, isn't it? So in, in other words, the, co the legal cost that post office spent in, mm. in pursuing that claim was significant. So just to, be, just to be clear, when I say I was unaware about this particular case, but we have seen earlier the reports that were being issued, but they were summarised reports with, with totals on them. So I'm sure this case would have been in there, but it may not have been separately identifiable. So you might not have known the name that's right. Lee Castleton. Yeah, that's right. But you... I can't, I can't remember, but there, there was reporting, so I, you know, which we've seen already this morning. Um, and did you not uh, think to ask why there was such a significant legal spend on one case? I just don't, I just don't recall. I, I can't... Well, I can't. Do you think why you wouldn't ask that? I can't think why I wouldn't. Uh, as, and so either it was a mistake on my part or it wasn't in the report. But I don't, I don't know. It, put it this way, 
this, this article was a shock to me. Uh, should it have been a shock to me? No, it shouldn't have been, but it was. Okay, that, that can come down, thank you. So that's the 11th of May. Um, you say in your statement, and you've already um, alluded to it, in fact, we, we can bring it up. Um, please, can we uh, go to page 28, paragraph 85 of the statement? We say, at the time, I did not con connect the Computer Weekly article to the complaint raised in the Porteous letter. Yes, and, and if I could just expand there. When I wrote that, I, I hadn't worked out that, that overlap. I hadn't spotted the date stamp on the, uh, on, on the letter. So the reason I didn't connect it was when the Computer Weekly article was the first thing I read, not the complaint. See what I mean? There is your evidence now that you did connect the two. Well, I, I connected it afterwards, saying is that when I saw the Computer Weekly article, I hadn't seen the complaint case. So do you think when you read the complaint after the Computer Weekly article, you would have connected the two? I can't, I can't remember. I mustn't claim things I can't actually remember, but uh, it seems likely. But um, Can we turn, please, to Paul... Two zeros one four one one four two. And if we can go to page two, please. And to the bottom. So this is an email from Dave Posnett. Now, we see there that the, the email it look, it looks to be dated 05-10, yeah. 2009. Immediately above, it's 20-10, 2009. And if we can go to the, just go up slightly, please. A, a bit more, please. I think there should be a date stamp. Ah, it might be on the other page, sorry. Sorry, can we go to uh, the bottom of page one, please? And it gets quite confusing because we've got a 05 t um, mm. slash 10 and then further up 02 slash 10. Um, the question I have is, in October 2009, are you aware of any investigation that was requested uh, into Horizon Integrity issues? Uh, yes, because it postdates the Computer Weekly. So you think the, this all leads from the Computer Yes, weekly? I would have thought so, yeah. I, I don't equally understand the dates because they appear to be in the wrong order, but it, it, it's October. It sort of doesn't really matter, I suspect. If we can now um, please turn to POL two zeros one five eight three six eight. And could we go to page twenty three, please? Down to the bottom, please. Thank you. Just slightly up, please. 
Perfect. Thank you. It's an email from Michael Rudkin. Does, do you remember Michael Rudkin? Yes, I, I, I recognise the name, yes. Or I, I'm obviously, I've read this stuff, but before mm. that I, I recognised his name. I think he was Federation connected in some way. Uh, it says, C attachment. I presume you've already seen the article in the convenience store magazine. Uh, and then there's a bullet point and the next um, paragraph goes on to say, this should also minimize adverse publicity to our industry, which is already uh, receiving enough bad press at the moment. Currently the BBC, Panorama and Watchdog researchers are digging the dirt here in Leicestershire. If we can then go up to see the forwarding email, please. I think it's on the beginning of the next page. Thank you. If we could go to the, the sorry, that was my fault. But yes, there we go, the Alan Cook email. Thank you. So this is the 15th of October. You send um, an email to Mary Fagan do you remember who Mary Fagan was? I definitely do. I definitely remember this email. Yep. Who's Mary Fagan? Uh, she was the, um, well, the PR officer for the Royal Mail Group. Um, it says in the second paragraph, for some strange reason, there is a steadily building nervousness about the accuracy of, horizon, of the Horizon system, and the press are now on it as well. Um, were you seeing this as a significant and escalating issue? I was then, yes. Yeah. Which, hence my... Well, I, I then express in the next sentence my confusion as, as to why. Um, but, but, it, but well, yes, I accepted that, that we had an issue. And were you connecting the various horizon challenges at that point? So the Portius Letter, the Computer Weekly... Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, this is... Um, this was a, a, around that time that it, it came to the fore for me, if you see what I mean. You go on to say, my instincts tell that mm. in a recession, subbies with their hand in the till choose to blame the technology when they are found to be short of cash. Why was your, your instinct to think that sub-postmasters who alleged that Horizon caused shortfalls were stealing from the post office? Well, that's an expression I'll regret for the rest of my life. So, you know, it was, it was an inappropriate thing to put in an email, um, not, not in line with my view of sub-postmasters, um, but one of, the, the, one of the often cited problems was at this time, uh, 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 Mike Hodgkinson talked sort of quite eloquently about the challenges that post office had faced in financial challenges um, and the danger is that we only think about the the profit or not that post office limited were making but I always used to say we haven't got one bottom line here we've got 12,001 bottom lines and if the post office isn't working then it isn't working for sub postmasters you know they've probably got a shop with a sub post office in it that sub post office needs to produce enough profit for them to make it worth having it there at all and so getting the business profitable again meant getting it profitable again for sub-postmasters. We had been through a few years when I joined when I don't think the post office earnings for sub-postmasters were worth the effort they had been putting in. Uh, and so that was, and so I think a number of them were struggling. And when we ran the branch closure program was an aim to reduce the number of uh, offices such that and then the same traffic would come through a smaller number of post offices and they would be more profitable which of course is what happened you're talking in a different context there. yes I sort of digressed on uh, um, the, yeah. because what's happened here is you faced challenges by sub postmasters yeah. saying that the system is faulty and saying that it's caused shortfalls correct and in perhaps an unguarded comment, you've put that the instincts 
were for it to effectively be that sub postmasters were stealing and then blaming the technology. Does that represent your actual views at the time? Uh, no, but it, 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 was, it was said. It, it was, it was Why did you say it if it wasn't your views? Well, uh, I had a, a friendly, informal relationship with Mary Fagan, and it was just an email I shouldn't have... It's just an email I shouldn't have written, but uh, it was important to me that she understood exactly where we were at. But she was a Royal Mail person, um, and um, it was one of the... The, one of the areas where I was very, very happy with the support I got from Royal Mail. So she was, she was uh, very helpful to me. She was a sounding board. Um, and I was probably more open and frank with what I was thinking with her than, than many other people. She was also in a different building, which, which meant that we swapped emails a lot. Uh, and so, uh, as I say, I, that sentiment was expressed. What I wrote in that email was unacceptable. It wasn't just to her, was it? It was to Mr. David Smith as well. Yeah, yeah, in the quite, yes. Yeah. Was it your view at the time that he would have shared your view? I don't, I don't know, to be honest. It, 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 was, it was regrettable. I, you know, I was, it was like I was just chatting to her in the corridor, but as you say, so it was, it was actually, there were other people on the copy list. Um, you said earlier that you were very shocked when you read the Computer Weekly article, mm. correct? Yes, yeah. Um, you'd received several letters from MPs making the same complaints. Afterwards, yes. Yes? Yes, yes. But there was, a, a, I think, a body of opinion growing here. Yeah. Uh, or, or at least a body of complaints, I should say. Yes. Uh, and you say at this point you decide you saw it as escalating and significant. Yeah. Why didn't you uh, arrange for an independent investigation at this point into the allegations? Well, I, the first step seemed to be to investigate it ourselves. Um, so that that was what we did, and we referred to the correspondence a few minutes ago, where that process of of, uh, of I forget the expression integrity or whatever it was was used. Um, was, you know, we needed, to, we needed to examine it ourselves and ask ourselves what could be wrong. What steps did you take to oversee that investigation? Well, um, I asked for the investigation to be done. Uh, I was keen to, to know who would do it. Uh, who did it? Uh, Andy McLean, who um, reported to Rick Francis. Um, and the reason I wanted to know who to do it was, did I... What did I think of the person that was going to do it? And Andy was a, you know, a no-nonsense, knowledgeable guy, who, to my mind, would, you know, speak out if, if he needed to. I suspect I, I, one of the problems I think is that we were still, I think, investigating the cases that had been highlighted. Um, as opposed to the whole thing, if you see what I mean. So there was, I, I, I still thought, we've got these cases that have got wrong, we've got, we've, we've got to find out the answer. But what I, stopped you from getting an external body in to do that? Well, nothing stopped me. I felt we should do the, the, the internal review first. Now, it is complicated by the fact that I left the business a few months afterwards, but, but at that stage... It, you know, you, you wouldn't get in an, an external review until you'd asked your own people to so investigate. Was your thinking that the you'd do an internal review first and then from there determine whether an external review was necessary? Yes, but I, 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 had, I had no particular expectation of what, what would be found um, because at that stage I thought we were talking about a handful of cases and it could have been a different problem for each one. Now, I, I, to be honest, by the time it all came out, I don't know what the problem was, but it was clearly wider than the cases that had been highlighted to me. Could we bring back up, please, poll 
Thank you. And see, that's an email from Dave Posnett on the 20th of October 2009, so five days after your mm. email, uh, which we were just at. You're not in copy. No. Uh, it refers to some conference calls. It says, Dave Smith phoned me last week, asked me a few questions, and indicated that Alan Cook is asking for more robust defence of Horizon. Were you asking for a defence of Horizon rather than an investigation into its integrity? De definitely not looking for a robust defence, <laughs> just, just looking for answers. Uh, one of the perils um, of, of being the boss is that people use your name to get things done. And, uh, you know, it, I would have... I would have responded to that if I'd been copied. But he said, could that's have, not what we're after. Dave Posnick could have used your name and said, Alan Cook is asking for an independent review of Horizon, or Alan Cook is asking could for yes. um, an, a review into its integrity. What was put was, Alan Cook is yes, asking for a more robust defence of Horizon. Um, are you saying those words didn't come from you? I, don't, I wouldn't have said that. I would have said... I'd, robust was a word I used... Uh, which I meant thorough and vigorous, but defence wouldn't have been a word I'd used. Robu you, you use robust to mean thorough. Yeah, yeah, but de but defence is 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 a different point. At, at this stage, um, there was the Computer Weekly article and a few complaints on specific cases, uh, and I was more than prepared to believe that the answer would be different to each of them, uh, and that. The answer wasn't that there's nothing wrong. Yeah, but, but obviously that's the stance that the organisation took in the event. Were you... The manner of you, the investigation, or, or um, how you chose to respond to um, these allegations, um, was that influenced by your instinctive view which we went to earlier about the sub postmasters no I, I could no it, it, it wasn't actually I, I, I my belief would be that we would find things that were wrong I'll, I'll put it another way we would find things that were not the fault of the people running those post office branches um, now it could have been the procedures they were required to follow it didn't necessarily have to be the technology but it seemed to me unlikely to have, I know it wasn't loads, but that many cases, well, what was it, seven, nine or ten cases, um, that all coming to my attention at the same time sounded like there was a problem. So what, what happened to the review? Well, I'm, I, I have difficulty in, in remembering. I think it went on past my departure. Sorry, I missed that. Um, I think it went on past my departure. Okay. Could we go back then, please, to um, POL two zeros one five eight three six eight? And I think it's page 22. Uh, no, sorry, the next page. My, my apologies. So we've got the Michael Rudkin email we went to at the start at the bottom there. So there, and then if we go, if you can go up, please. That was the response, the end of the response, which we, we referred to. And you're forwarding it, saying, we should therefore be careful of approaching him further, for further info without talking to Paula first. Uh, who are you referring to there? Paula, Paula Venels. For Paula Venels? Yeah. And why did you need to talk to Paula Venels first? I'm not sure, really. 
I obviously thought it was a good idea at the time, but it, this, was, um, this was a network issue, and she was responsible for the network. Um, so I, I didn't want to... There were two lines I could go down. I could go down the, the, the operations director line, responsible for the technology, or I could go down the network line, which was Paula. Um, and we were, we were focusing... I was focusing too much on the operations line, and Paula needed to be brought into the picture. Could we go to the page before, please, just to see the, the email chain up? Thank you. If you could just carry on going up, please. So that email, which was on the 15th of October, is forwarded um, by Ruth Barker to Paula Reynolds on the 5th of November. We then see the next day, Paula Venels replies to Ruth Barker, and you're in copy. Yep. It says, Ruth, the attachment needs to be in email format, please. Alan and I are out of the office, and so need to view it on Blackberries. Also, we need the original email. What was attached looked more like a PowerPoint of a press cutting. Do you recall what conversation you had with Paula Venels about this email? I, I don't actually know. Sorry. Do you remember discussing anything to do with an investigation into these issues with Paula Venels? Uh, I, I issued the uh, investigation request down the sort of operations line. See what I mean? So because, uh, because I was seeing it as a technology issue. It was the reference to the Federation which meant I felt Paula should be in the loop. Plus, it was her branches, if you like, that we were, we were dealing with questions from. In your statement, um, that document could come down, thank you. In your statement, you say at paragraph 101 that I gave, my note, I gave notice of my resignation to Adam Crozier around late October or early November of 2009, and it was accepted. Yeah. So around the time that you forwarded this email, um, oh, sorry, not you, the email was forwarded to Paula Venels. Yes, it would have been that sort of. And so at this, do you think at that time you were, you had resigned or were thinking about it? Uh, well, it's, um, it's embarrassing that I can't tell you the actual date, but I, I mean, I kept all the correspondence, but I kept it for the seven years for the tax purposes and then, and then binned it all. So I can't remember the exact date, but I would have said it was, well, I can't say more than what I put in the statement, really. It was late October or early November that I went to see Adam and said, I'd, I'd like to resign. Um, I said, I'd like to see out the financial year uh, because one of my criteria for success was, would, would, sorry, would the business get back into profit and we wanted the end of the year. Uh, and he asked me, uh, he asked me to not say anything until the new year. Now, following that, I then realised that if I said something at the beginning of the new year, that Parliament would be in recess. And um, Pat McFadden, who was the minister, um, I was very supportive of. He'd worked quite closely with me, so I rang Adam and said, can I tell Pat before Parliament recesses? So I rang Pat McFadden in December and told him, and then I told my top team on the 4th of January. So that was the, the public position, effectively, um, or am I misunderstanding you? Yes, it did. So, so it went public. After, I told the top team, yes. then there was an internal communication, and, and we, we told the world, as it were, that I was going. Standing back, why do you think you were, on the uh, 6th of November, speaking about your email of the 15th of October with Paula Venels? Why do what? Sorry, say that again. So let's bring the email back up. Yeah. Uh, Paul, two zeros, one five eight three six eight. I wasn't planning on leaving until the end of March. That's not how it transpired. So I, Can we, me uh, resigning wouldn't change my behaviour. Page 20, I think it's 22. Keep. 
So we have the email at the bottom on the 15th of October, mm -hmm. 2009. And then at the top is Paul Venel's 6th of November, in which you're copied. Yep. And it says, Ruth, the attachment needs to be in email format, please. Alan and I are out of the office. So yep. it's implying that the two of you uh, are together. No, not necessarily. We, we, didn't, we didn't go out together no. much at all. No, no, we'd been in different parts of the network, would be my guess. But it, does it imply that you were, because she's requested this email with you in copy, does it re imply that you were working on it together or discussing it together? Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm, sure we, I'm sure we would have done, um, but it... So my question is, why at this stage were you discussing it with Paula Venels? Well, for the reasons I said, this was an important issue and she needed to be aware of it. I'll leave that. Um, that can come down, I'll move on. Uh, I'm going to go back in the chronology slightly as the last topic uh, on the impact programme. Do you recall what the impact programme was? Yes, yes. So it was a major change to the accounting procedures effectively. Right, yep. And before the impact programme, sub-postmasters would balance a cash account, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. And each, that cash account would be completed at the end, well, at the end, on a Wednesday, uh, on a weekly basis, yes? I couldn't have told you that, but it sounds right, yeah. Do you remember the, the change that, that came about because of the impact programme? I, I, I probably don't, to be honest. I, you, you have a point, but I'll... Well, before the impact programme, if a sub-postmaster balanced their books and had a discrepancy which they couldn't explain... Oh, this is the rolling forward the discrepancy. They were able to ask for authorization to put it in a suspense account. Yeah. Correct? I've learnt this since, yes. I've learnt this by reading all the correspondence, yeah. And then roll over into the next yeah. trading period while it was investigated. Following the impact programme, rather than weekly, the sub-postmasters had to balance every four or five weeks, yes? Yes. And if there was a discrepancy that they couldn't explain, they no longer could keep it in a suspense account and roll into the next trading period. Correct? Yeah. And they had to, uh, they were post office sought debt recovery from them at the end of the trading period, or it could be settled centrally and paid off in due mm. course. Mm. Could we turn please to poll three zeros three two one four seven? This is uh, a meeting on the board meeting, sorry, on the 17th of August. I see third line down, you're there as a non executive director. Yeah. Can we turn to page seven, please? And if you could go down to the impact programme, thank you. B. It says the objective of the programme was to save costs, replace obsolete back office systems, improve branch and client accounting, improve debt recovery. When it says debt recovery, from whom were those debts being recovered? From uh, sub postmasters, crown offices, um, franchisees. I, I assume that's what it meant. I mean, I, this was, uh, we had a finance function in Chesterfield and in my head when we were in this meeting this was new technology for Chesterfield which flowed out into the yes. branches. Yes, but the board is effectively discussing how it can get uh, improved debt recovery from maybe others but from sub-postmasters. Amongst other things, yes. And Notice save time in branches as well, it was a very labour intensive process. So this was... But this was for the benefit of Post Office Limited. And saves time in branches, which is a benefit to all branches. But it, it... At E, Mr Corbett speaks um, 
it says that the rollout was not expected to be noise free. And one of the risks was concern regarding debt recovery. Do you remember what that concern was? No, I, I don't. I remember the, the higher call volumes, as I said, this was about um, the Chesterfield operation and that new procedures would generate a lot more phone calls from people coming to terms with you know, the, the different procedures. As is often the case with these things, you introduce a labour-saving device, but there's a bump to get through when people are coming to terms with new procedures or different buttons to press on the system or whatever that it produces more activity, more mistakes for a while, and then things settle down. So I think, I think what Peter was highlighting in general is this was quite material change, and there would, there would be a disruption as a result of it. And he then goes on to outline what, what risk mitigants he'd got in place to counter it. If we can turn over the page, please. Thank you. Um, at the top, in F, it says, planned completion of the new finance system was uh, 24th August 2005. A branch trading pilot would commence 14th September, and full branch rollout was planned on 30th of November. Um, those, are, those words, branch trading pilot, branch trading, that's the specific terminology used for, for um, balancing and trading periods, isn't it? I would assume so, yes. Yes, there's, there's, there's probably, probably a word missing. It might have been branch trading statement or something, I don't know. But. In your statement, um, we don't need to turn it up, but it's um, page 13, the top paragraph. You refer to the, um, you start, you refer to the impact program. My understanding of your evidence is you, you, you weren't told, or you, your evidence is you weren't told that the ability to put uh, discrepancies into the loss, the suspense account was taken away. Is no, that... we didn't, I, I didn't know that then, no. And is your evidence it wasn't discussed at that board meeting? Uh, yes, I certainly don't recall it. Um, I mean, I was then quote just an, a non-exec, so it was an item of detail which they probably felt they didn't need to share. Oh, subsequent knowledge indicates that that was quite an important uh, development, really. Could we look, please, at poll three zeros two one four one nine? It's another risk and compliance uh, note. Your, it's your apologies, so this you're is, not in attendance. This is the non-exec period, yes. That's yes. Right. Yeah. But you would have read the minutes? Yes, I would have hoped so. Can we turn to page five, please? talks about the impact, um, the program status, sev several problems but workarounds are in place for servicing clients. And there are issues with system response times, mapping and systems. And if we go down please to the 3.4 branch audit findings. Got positive action has been taken through branch control since last year. This has reduced the incidence of suspense accounts being abused to conceal fraud. However, there is an increase in the numbers of losses covered by inflating cash figures. Impacts will in the longer term improve cash MI here. What's, what does MI stand for? Management information. But short term action is needed between teams involved in cash to improve the analysis and clean up uh, of data. Was the board implementing the impact program precisely in order to avoid the postmasters using the suspense account. 
Oh, no. <laughs> no, that would be... Uh, I mean, this was, a, this was a major piece of expenditure. This was, this was about um, upgrading the financial... I mean, obviously, it was all initiated before I joined, but it was about equipping Chesterfield correctly to do the finances and how that flowed through, you know, into branches of all, of all types. So there was... Uh, there was nothing... It, that would have not been the motive. Did anyone... Um whenever you were in any discussion about the impact program, um, question how it would affect the postmasters? I don't recall a conversation like that. And, and you know, interestingly, the way I'm talking, it, I had this impression it was more about computerising Chesterfield, but not without consequence in branches, because that's, that's where the money was coming from. But, um, it wasn't the objective, you see what I mean? Sir, um, that's my question. If I may just take a moment just to confer with Ms. Price on a, on a matter. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I understand that two uh, sets of core participants wish to uh, make, uh, ask some questions. I'm told that there will be five minutes each. Okay, let them ask their questions then. My name is uh, Sam Steen. I represent a large number of uh, sub postmasters and mistresses. I'm instructed by a firm of solicitors called How and Co. Did you watch the evidence of Mr. Hodgkinson yesterday? Sorry, Sir Michael Hodgkinson. I did. Yes. Yes. Uh, you seem to use the term prosecuting authority, which I assume you took from the evidence of uh, Sir Michael yesterday. Did you understood the word prosecuting authority from his evidence yesterday? Y yes. The term you used. Yes. And you were aware that later on in your term as managing director that you were the prosecuting authority for the post office. Is that correct? Well, uh, as I've already explained, yeah. but my, my view of that changed during my time. Right. Well, let's have a quick look at that then, please. Can we go to the document, which is POL, P-O-L, triple zero, four eight three six one. First page, please. Thank you. If we look, please, at the very top of that document, uh, we see it says... Post Office Limited investigation team monthly report. We get from that that you got these monthly. Mm -hmm. It says confidential, and it then goes on to say to who it is written. Paul E.T., let's move on from that for the moment, Director Security Corporate, Head of Investigations Corporate, Head of Criminal Law, comma, Head of Security uh, Post Office Limited. So let's just go through that. At that time, the head of criminal law was Rob Wilson, a solicitor. Do you remember him? No, I don't, I'm afraid. No? What did you think the, head of, what did you think the criminal law team did within the post office? Uh, well, it looks like it's at Royal Mail, isn't it? It says corporate head. Well, what but, did you think the criminal law team did? Royal Mail or post office? Well, they were involved with these prosecutions, I guess. Involved with the prosecution? Yes. Yes? Yes. Right. So this document in 2006, in reference to you, because um, you were part of the uh, looking at this sort of material, um, head of criminal law, Rob Wilson, still doesn't ring a bell? No, it, it doesn't, I'm afraid. Sorry. Oh, OK. And the, the investigation team um, it, that uh, clearly this is in relation to, this monthly report, uh, shall we have a quick look at what's going on with that? Middle of the page there, you see in the document we've got on the screen, Investigation team report, period 9, December 2000, period 9, December 2006. The principal aims of the investigation team are to stop criminal offences taking place, apprehend and prosecute those who commit offences against us in order to maximise our recovery and reduce loss to poll and its clients through the identification of areas of weakness throughout the business, both operationally and within our product offerings. But it does appear on the face of this document that you've got information that there's a criminal law team that's operating within the business, and secondly, an investigation team with aims of um, stopping criminal offences taking place, 
apprehending and prosecuting people. Yeah, well, look at item one. It's all about postal order cashback offers and, and the fraud losses that were experienced as a result. That was nothing to do with sub-postmasters. Well, what this do you is, think is, when it refers to... Fraud, it, it, it's, it's customer fraud. What do you think? We call them scams today, but, they, you know, this is... This, this is what it was there for. There was, there was, there's always going to be lots of criminal activity around an organisation that creates a lot of money. That doesn't mean it's the sub-postmaster's fault. So you had reports in relation to sub-postmasters that were being prosecuted and mm -hmm. that there was the involvement of an investigation team. Is that yep. correct? Yes. So you had oversight of an investigation team that investigated sub-postmasters. Is that correct? It is. Right. And we can now see that there was a criminal law team engaged mm. as well, yes? Yes, but right. it's broader than just sub-postmasters. Well, let's stay with sub-postmasters for the moment, because yeah. you may have noticed that this inquiry is about sub-postmasters. Yes, I All have right? noticed that. I have noticed that. Right. Well, let's then move on and then have a look and think about what was happening to sub-postmasters being investigated by the investigation team operating under your managing director directorial responsibilities, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you, um, as an example, uh, consider the numbers of uh, cases that were being prosecuted? I didn't have. I didn't have the total number that was being uh, pursued. No. Okay. Let's go to the bottom of page two, please, of the same document. And look, please, at two point zero. Yep. Investigation operations. This month's recovery figure is £63,000. Uh, Period 9 case figures, uh, case raised figures for deficiencies at audit, at audit alone were £140,000. Where it says raised figures for deficiencies at audit, what did you think that meant? Yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. Uh, right. We did have the numbers in, in that report. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, in total, 31 new investigation cases were raised during the period with a current loss of £245,000. That, that's not the same as prosecutions, obviously, but they were cases that were being looked at. Next, at present, the team is dealing with 248 ongoing investigations with a loss value of in excess of £9 million. Of these, 80 are currently going through the courts. Yeah. So you're getting these sorts of reports monthly. There are discussions involving the investigation operation. In discussions and information regarding cases being prosecuted and losses, you had all of the information that was possible to have to actually have governance over this area, didn't you, Mr Cook? I had, I had the relevant information there. I, I certainly... Well, I've, I've, already, I've already said that I could have done more. But Well, then let's go over the page. We can see that uh, at the bottom of page two, sorry, it says also provided as a summary of major inquiries ongoing. Uh, top of page three, please, same document. Now, we can see across there that there are, um, it looks like, Excel documents that are being referred to. Uh, ignore the first one. Over 100K hundred, over hundred live cases, which appears to be, no doubt, a list of the cases worth a, over £100,000. All right? And then underneath that, you've then got references to uh, 4.0 financial investigations in uh, as regards to uh, post office branches. So the information you were getting was pretty comprehensive regarding the ongoing investigation and conduct of prosecutions as they were going onwards mm. under your time at the post office, wasn't it, Mr Cook? It was, but right. I, 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 I don't wish to let the impression be created that this was there to chase sub-postmasters. This was there to chase fraud in general. OK, well, let's just say, as I said before, we'll stick with postmasters if you don't yes, mind. Yes, but I need to make sure that context is, is understood. Paragraph 59 of your statement, you thank say... You. Yes, Mr Cook. I say thank you for acknowledging my comment. Paragraph 59 of your statement, you say this. To the best of my knowledge, the Risk and Compliance Committee was not given any information or reporting, nor did I have any oversight of the prosecution of SPMs. As a result, I did not take any steps as a member of the Risk and Compliance Committee to ensure that Poll was acting in compliance with its legal obligations in relation to those prosecutions and civil proceedings against SPMs. I was not aware they were taking place. It's just a straight out lie, isn't it, Mr Cook? Um, the, the point I was trying to make was about the initiation of, of prosecutions. I have, I have repeatedly acknowledged that there were, uh, there were uh, cases under investigation. 
and that I was aware there were cases under investigation. What you're saying in your statement is this. You did not take any steps as a member of the Risk and Compliance Committee to ensure that Poll was acting in compliance with its legal obligations in relation to those prosecutions and civil proceedings against SPMs. I was not aware they were taking place. Well, first of all, you do agree you were aware they were taking mm. place. And secondly, in your statement, you're pretending that you weren't aware to avoid the implication which you needed oversight of the things. No, no. Just simply that not was, true, isn't it, Mr. That Cook? was not my intention. Then why did you write that in your statement, Mr. Cook? Mm. Well, I believed it at the time, certainly. That Give me one moment. Thank you, sir. Right. Who's next? I am, sir. Henry. <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Cook. 17 Hi. years ago, on the 12th of April, 2007, you were the managing director of the post office, weren't you? I was. And you probably have no idea what you were doing that day, I suppose. No, I'm sure not. But Mrs. Janet Skinner, who sits to my right, whom you can see here, knows exactly what was happening to her that day because on the 12th of April 2007 she was being released from prison having served a nine-month sentence for false accounting. Mm. She'd been jailed on the lie, Mr Cook, that Horizon was infallible. But you say you had no idea that these prosecutions were being instituted in your name, is that right? No, well, I, I knew there were, there were prosecutions. She pleaded guilty to false accounting only because she'd been told that if she did not, the post office would prosecute and pursue her for theft. Mm. She hadn't stolen a penny, Mr Cook. All of this was being done in your name, and yet you claim you didn't know. I, I just can't be more apologetic. It just... It's, Mrs Skinner was the mother of two young children, wrongly accused of theft. She was told that if she pleaded to false accounting as an alternative to that baseless theft charge, she wouldn't go to prison. Now, this was common practice by the post office, charge theft and accept a plea to false accounting. Were you aware of that stratagem, Mr Cook? No, in, in fact, worse than that, I... I, I, I when I had reports about them and the, the, the individual had pleaded guilty, then, then I thought we must have been in the right. I did not appreciate the, what, what was going on. So this stratagem was reinforcing your ignorance and the general prejudice that these sub-postmasters had their hand in the till. Is that right? I, in the particular cases where the individual pleaded guilty, I, I had assumed that they believed they were guilty. It, it didn't occur to me at the time that that, that was a uh, recommended to them by their lawyers. If it was the question. most profound structural injustice. Yeah, yeah I agree. A unmeritorious charge of theft was being used as a jemmy or sledgehammer to force a plea or to crush sub-postmasters into submission. I, d I don't know if that was a deliberate strategy by the post office, but that's how it manifested itself, and it's unacceptable. It was a strategy, and you ought to have been aware of that strategy. Do you accept that now, not with hindsight, but what you ought to have known at the time? I, d I did not know that at the time. But well, you I ought would... to have known it at the time, Mr Cook. Do you accept I ought, that? I, yes, I do accept I ought to have known it. I didn't know it. It would be nothing that I would ever willingly want to do. Yes. Now, of course, it didn't do Mrs Skinner any good because she was sent to custody all the same, nine months' imprisonment. But before she was imprisoned, like so many sub-postmasters, she'd suffered fictional horizon shortfalls and had made 116 calls to the National Business Support Centre helpline complaining about balancing faults in the 18 months before she was dismissed. Wrongly dismissed, Mr Cook, yep. because your auditors thought she'd had her hand in the till. It's Are you proud of presiding over that culture? Definitely not. No. Do you accept that the ultimate responsibility for her torment 
lay with you as managing director of the post office? It, it, it did. I was, I was the managing director, so I was ultimately accountable. Whether I was aware is another matter, and if I wasn't aware, I should have been aware. Right. But as you have claimed, you maintain that you had no idea that these prosecutions were actually being instituted in your name. I, no, I, well, nearly correct. What, what I was saying was that I had no idea that the post, up until the Computer Weekly article, that the post office could initiate those um, without having to seek approval from any other party or body. So there was no moderating influence. I, that is what I was not aware of. Now, those prosecutions the Court of Appeal Criminal Division stated should never have been brought because they were an affront to the conscience of the court. What do you have to say for yourself about that, sir? Well, all I can do is repeat what I said at the beginning, is I, I just apologise unreservedly. I, I'm not the sort of guy that is malicious or would want to do harm to anyone, but it was, and, and I was not aware, but it, that is not an excuse. It's an explanation. There's no excuse for the fact that this happened, and it was on my watch. Um, and, you know, this, this is what this inquiry is about, is to establish um, how, that, how that could have happened. And I've tried my honest best to portray exactly what I recall happening many, many years ago. And, but it's not acceptable. It's, it's not acceptable. Finally, do you have anything by way of a personal direct apology that you would like to say to... Mrs. Skinner. I would. I would love to talk to her afterwards, but you may not want to. <laughs> but I, 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 I can only apologise on behalf of the whole organisation for the way that you were treated. It was disgraceful. I can only apologise personally that whilst I, I had not heard of your case, I'm, I'm nevertheless, uh, I, I have an accountability that I should have been on top of it. And I wasn't. Uh, there's nothing more I could say. This, um, this will be with you for the rest of your life. It will be with me for the rest of my life. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Henry. Um, I've just got a few questions, um, Mr. Cook. Yes. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, the instruction you issued to Mr. McLean to uh, carry out an investigation. Oh, yes. I Yep. Investigation, um, just in a neutral sense. Um, and I'd like paragraph 79 on page 27 of your witness statement to be put up on the screen, please. It's WITN001901001. Thank you. Now, um, if you'd just like to refresh your memory by just scanning that for the moment. Yes, I have. I have. Thank you. That's fine. Well, then, these are my questions. Uh, you have told me that in early May uh, 2009, this um, possibility that there were a number of cases involving a challenge to Horizon came as a bit of a bolt out of the blue for you. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And your first reaction was to instruct Mr. McLean to investigate, and you did so because you thought highly of him. Yes. In your statement. But then, reading the rest of that paragraph, it seems to me at least, and this is what I want your help with, that this um, inquiry just petered out. Because what you say is, I was assured at that time that the Horizon system was functioning normally, but I do not recall the detailed outcome of Mr. McLean's investigation, nor have I been provided with any documents relating to the investigation by the inquiry. Yeah. Now, breaking that down, it, it may be that you're saying that either Mr. McLean or someone on his behalf said to you orally 
everything's fine. But apart from that, there doesn't appear to be any uh, document or report or anything else that you have seen, which actually gives us the result of Mr. McLean's investigation. Is, is that as you understand I, it? I agree, sir. Yes, I, I wouldn't have settled for everything's fine, uh, but I haven't been able to... I haven't been given any history or documentation that shows what he produced. Um, well, I can't. I can't remember what the what the res what the response was, but I wouldn't have. Um, I wouldn't have been able to carry on without, you know, an investigation. And I think we saw during the course of uh, my evidence that there was still quite a lot of activity going on. Some time later, so I yeah. believe that was the moment that the organisation started examining itself. Um, but as we've come to learn, um, there were many people that wanted to just prove that it was OK, put it that way. Yeah, but, but my understanding is that um, you didn't actually leave a uh, post office until early the following year. Yeah, about the end of January, that's right, yeah. So approximately seven, eight months after you had instigated yes. an investigation by Mr. McLean. And forgive me if this sounds critical, and perhaps it is critical, that there doesn't appear to be any urgency on your part to get an answer from him if you allowed eight months to go by. Well, I think we've, we've seen evidence of activity still going on in October, November. Um, but, but I just, you know, I just cannot recollect seeing a final report um, and uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to say that, but I'm, I'm only going to say what I completely yeah. clearly remember. I, I am, uh, throughout this process, as documents have emerged, it fills in the picture for me. It, it helps me remember. So I remember the story. I have difficulty remembering the order and the dates. So I remember moments. Yeah. The Computer Weekly letter was a moment, right, that, that, that had a, a big impact on me. Um, but I can't, wi without evidence sort of being produced, I can't point to what happened next, which is why I wrote the witness statement as I did, because I can't claim something. That but I can I remember. take that you have no memory of Mr. McLean producing a written report before you left uh, your position as managing director? I find that difficult to believe that there wasn't one, but I can't remember it, and uh, I haven't seen anything. All right. Thank you very much. Now, sorry to prolong it, but there's one further short series of questions about the case that, you re that, that was referred to in the um, Computer Weekly report, uh, weekly uh, article, and that's the case of Mr. Castleton. All right. Yeah. Yeah. You you said that you had no idea of Mr. Castleton's case, um, certainly the name Castleton, until you read that article. And I just want to ask you about the process for making decisions when the post office was involved in quite high profile high court litigation. Mm. All right. Mm. The post office instigated proceedings against Mr. Castleton for approximately, the figure doesn't matter, but approximately £25,000, uh, said to be a shortfall and evidenced by uh, data from Horizon. Mr. Castleton uh, defended it on the basis that there was no shortfall and this was all the fault of the computer, all right? Mm -hmm. It gr gradually grew from being what might be called a fairly conventional action for the recovery of a debt into a potential uh, large-scale argument about whether or not Horizon was reliable, OK? And this was all unfolding in the first um, eight, nine, ten months of you being manager and director. But, but none of this got to you. From, from what you told me. 
No, I, I mean, the, the, the learnings from this are there. Anyway, so, Sorry, come on. so let me carry on. Yeah. Came a point in time when the very experienced barrister who was acting for the post office told the experienced solicitor who'd instructed him, who in turn told the legal department of the post office, that the costs involved in this case were grossly out of proportion to what you were trying to get from Mr. Castleton. Um, and they ought to think seriously about whether it was worth spending all that money, all right? But in the end, all that money was spent so that the total amount uh, of the debt and the costs came to well over £300,000. Yeah. What I want to ask you about is, what was the process back in 2006 for authorising the expenditure of those sums of money? In the post office, yeah, and and that was what I, that was what I was about to prematurely uh, talk about. I mean, it, it, there's there's an irony, isn't it, that if if somebody in the organisation wanted to buy a piece of equipment, they'd probably have to get umpteen forms signed in order to be able to spend the money, and yet somehow or other, this this spend decisions were being made in that in that prosecution, and uh, there should have been a set of delegated authorities that said you're authorised to spend up to this much money and because one of the issues is a case starts off, as you've explained, a case starts off modest and becomes big. So not only should they be, require sign-off from an expenditure perspective, there should be a cap on how far it can go without coming back and asking for more. Clearly, that was not in place. And, so they were but, and it certainly, they certainly did not come to me for approval. So we had delegated authorities in place that would allow people below me. Um, and and so, this would have probably lied with Paula Venels as the network director, would have been yeah. able to sign that off. Right. So, so, so that um, what it amounts to is that there would have been a person within the post office organisation who would have had authority to sign off so, spending the money without taking it either to you or to the board. Correct. And so can you, did you tell me that most likely person was Paula Venos? Yes, I think so. All right, thank the, you very much. The legal function would have sought approval from the business, and the business in this case would have been the person that ran the branches. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cook, for providing your witness statement and for um, coming to give evidence to the inquiry this morning. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Mr. Stevens, how are we um, proceeding next? I think um, Mr. Beer's preference is to uh, switch witnesses immediately, if we can, and make a start now. Certainly, by all means. Um, I'll just sit here quietly till you do it, if you like. Uh, I'm so, so, I, and so we may need a short break, actually. Do we need a... Yeah, so uh, the transcriber needs a short break. Yeah, sure. All right, so um, 25 to 1, 10 minutes? Yep, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, may I call Adam Crozier, please? Yeah. I do solemnly... I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Please look inside. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Crozier. My name is Jason Beer, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you tell us your full name, please? Uh, Adam Alexander Crozier. Thank you very much for previously providing a witness statement to the inquiry and for giving evidence today to assist us in our investigation. Can we start, please, with your witness statement? Uh, the URN is WITN 04390100. You should have a hard copy in front of you. It's 34 pages long, excluding the exhibits pages, and is dated the 28th of February 2024. If you turn to page 34, is that your signature? It is, yes. And are the contents of it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are indeed. 
Thank you. I'm not going to ask you questions about all elements of the witness statement. It stands as your evidence and is being made available on the inquiry's website. Can I start with your background, please? Um, between February 2003 and April 2010, so for just over seven years, you were a director and chief executive officer of um, Royal Mail Group. That's correct. Um, and a director of Royal Mail Holdings. Yes. The first being a limited company, the second a PLC. Yes. Uh, before joining um, Royal Mail, you held senior roles in uh, Saatchi and Saatchi from 1988 to 1999. Is that right? Uh, 1995. Well, uh, I started there in 1988. Yes. All the way through to 1999, yes. Yes, I think that's what I said, 88 to 99. Sorry. But the last four years as a joint chief exec. Correct. And then you served from 2003 onwards, uh, sorry, until 2003, uh, i.e. immediately before joining the Royal Mail Group as the Chief Executive of the Football Association. Correct. Uh, can I start, please, um, uh, looking uh, at the corporate structure of Royal Mail? And I'm going to try and summarise and see whether you agree um, in the interest of time with um, the summary. At first, there was a parent company, uh, Royal Mail Holdings PLC. Yes. Uh, that was wholly and directly owned by the single shareholder, the government? Yes. Uh, Royal Mail Holdings PLC had its own board? Correct. It had its own management board? Correct. Uh, you attended all Royal Mail Holdings PLC um, board meetings and you sat on the management board? That's correct. Uh, the chairman of Royal Mail Holdings uh, PLC in your tenure was firstly Alan Layton, between 2008 and, sorry, 2002 and 2008, is that right? That's correct. And then Donald Bryden from 2009 onwards? Yes. Uh, Royal Mail Holdings PLC board, I'm going to call that the main board. Uh, the main board had its own audit and risk committee. Yes. Upon which you sat? Uh, yes. Attended, yes. 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 You were, were you a member of it or were you an attendee? Uh, I think I was an attendee, actually. And just um, for those not steeped in uh, corporate governance, the difference between being a member of a, a committee and an attendee is? Uh, the, I think the, the members were all uh, non-exec directors. Uh, can, can we uh, move uh, on in the summary? There were a range of separate businesses within uh, the Royal Mail and they were separated out in different ways, some of them being subsidiaries of Royal Mail and others not. Is that right? Yes. Uh, Post Office Limited was one of those uh, entities, and that was a separate legal entity. Is that right? That's correct. And that was Post Office Limited? Yes. Uh, Post Office Limited had its own board? It did. It had its own chairman? It did. In your tenure, they were... Uh, Sir Michael Hodgkinson, uh, from whom we heard yesterday, and then from 2009, Donald Bryden. That's right. I think that means that Mr. Bryden, um, from 2009, was um, chairman of both Royal Mail Holdings PLC and Post Office Limited. Yes, he was. Uh, the Post Office had its own uh, managing director or CEO, the title changed. That's correct. In your tenure, that was um, David Mills, from whom we hear next week and then from 2006, Alan Cook, from whom we have just heard. Yes. Uh, that person, the MD or the CEO, sat on both the Royal Mail Holdings PLC and the Royal Mail Management Board. Uh, yes. Uh, the Post Office Limited had its own um, Risk and Compliance Committee. That's right. Now, I think in one way or another, I've taken all of those points from your witness statement. Uh, you make all of those points in one way or another in your witness statement. Taking all of those points together, are you um, effectively saying in your witness statement that within uh, Royal Mail uh, Holdings PLC's group of separate business units, the post office had a relatively high degree of autonomy from Royal Mail Group? Yes, uh, under its delegated powers of authority. 
of the business units within the group uh, did the post office enjoy the greatest level of autonomy? Yes, it did. It was the only one with its own governance set up. I missed the last word, the own, only one only with its one own governance set up. Yes, Thank set you. up, yes, sorry. And why was it that it enjoyed the greatest level of autonomy from Royal Mail? I think it, was, uh, it goes right back to when uh, the 2000 Act, Postal Act, where the government set up the company and it had two very different objectives. For Royal Mail, it was to be uh, modernised and be a commercial company in a market that was to be opened up to competition. Uh, and on the post office side, it was to try and become a sustainable public service. So two very different objectives. Uh, and that separate governance ran right through to uh, them also having their own direct relationship with the shareholder and within the shareholder executive, a different team within that team. Thank you. Do, was the result of that that you, as CEO of Royal Mail, place very substantial reliance on the post office board and the post office executive team in the running of Post Office Limited? Uh, I did indeed, and it's partly why both the chairman and the CEO of the post office uh, also sat on the holdings board. Uh, the chairman of Royal Mail sat on the post office board and the other piece of glue was the company secretary who sat on both. But what it did mean through those delegated authorities was that the post office uh, largely was able to go about its business without reference to the Royal Mail board other than on two really key things. One was on funding, which fundamentally impacted on the solvency of the whole group. Uh, and secondly, on certain major multi-year contracts where it took it beyond its delegated authority limits. And I think it later will come on to the fact that the Fujitsu contract was one of those. It was indeed, yes. Looking back now, do you think there should have been a, maybe a third added to the list of things that uh, the post office ought to have come back to uh, Royal Mail Holdings uh, more and more frequently on namely the conduct of investigations and criminal prosecutions? Uh, not at the time, no. Um, I certainly thought that all the correct checks and balances were in place, um, both in terms of internal and external audit, in terms of internal and external legal advice. Um, there was the Paul Risk Committee, the Paul Exec Committee and the Paul Board, and through all those checks and balances, I think there was some confidence that things were working and certainly no one in that chain uh, at any stage expressed any concerns uh, about the conduct in the area you've just mentioned. If Royal Mail and you within Royal Mail uh, was reliant on the post office to represent post office matters, whether in the management board or the main board of Royal Mail, if they did not um, raise or mention any issues to you of concern or which were problematic, was there any mechanism by which you and Royal Mail could find out about such issues? Of course. Um, well, of course, there was the structure I just mentioned of all the checks and balances, which I won't go through again. But the checks and balances you mentioned were within the post office. They were, but on top I'm of... I'm talking about the checks and balances in, in um, you learning about things that they didn't want to tell you about. Yeah. Well, first of all, there were constant one-to-one -one meetings uh, with the CEO of the post office. Um, just, just stopping you there, uh, Mr. Crozier. Of course. D does that place um, a high burden on the managing director or CEO of Post Office Limited to be open and transparent with Royal Mail Holdings, and in particular with you? So uh, we both myself and the board, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, there was constant... The whole company, because of what we inherited, effectively, on the Royal Mail side, a broken 
company that hadn't been invested in for a decade, hadn't hit its quality of services, was the least modernised postal company in Europe. Um, what that meant was on the Royal Mail side, uh, there was no option other than to be fundamentally transparent in the fact that most of what we inherited wasn't working. And that encouraged a lot of transparency. And we set up a uh, properly functioning internal audit unit, which was, of course, one of the ways that we could also find out what was happening elsewhere in the group. Uh, and we strengthened that. Uh, we created a whole... Uh, uh, risk agenda in the business where we got from the ground up people to uh, let everyone know what their key risks were. They looked at that risk register. That risk register was debated uh, at the Just executive. stopping you there, can, um, can you recall whether the conduct of prosecutions and the possibility of um, bringing uh, sub-postmasters to justice, including by imprisoning them, and the issues that arise when conducting prosecutions was on the Royal Mail Holdings risk register? Um, I don't believe so, and I don't believe I recall seeing it on the post office register, no. Is that a failing? With the benefit of hindsight, yes. I.e. conducting an activity which is unusual for a, a company? Would you agree? Yes. An activity that um, of itself carries um, unusual risks. Indeed. And would you agree that that unusual activity would require a different type of supervision and oversight because it brings the company into contact with the criminal justice system? Uh, yes, um, and that's why there were um, lots of checks and balances around the internal and external legal advice. Uh, and it's Sorry, say that again. That's why there were lots of checks and balances around the... Internal and external legal advice. Uh, what, what do you mean by that? Well, we had lots of external lawyers involved with the company. We also had prosecutions on the Royal Mail side, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and there, there were multiple interactions, much more straightforward things with police and uh, crime prosecution services. What external lawyers are you referring to that gave comfort in um, the prosecution of sub-postmasters? I don't recall which ones the post office used at the time, I'm sorry. Did you think at the time that um, prosecutions of sub-postmasters were conducted... Uh, by external lawyers? Uh, I believe they had a big role in that, yes. And uh, by conducted, do you mean the person standing up in court, either the barrister or an employed barrister or a solicitor with rights of audience, or do you mean conducted the whole thing? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Was there a way for people within the post office to report issues to you or to the Royal Mail Board if the post office MD or CEO uh, was not inclined to do so? Uh, yes, uh, through a function called, well, we had a whistleblowing uh, 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 in operation, and we also, which we constantly updated uh, and tried to improve, and we also had a survey called Have Your Say, uh, which was entirely anonymous and allowed people to um, effectively give us whatever feedback they thought would be helpful. Was that effectively a department or a, a, a business function, both of those things? A, a, a team ran both of those things, yes. And two different teams, actually. And um, how were the um, complaints or issues raised from that um, fed through to you, if at all? Uh, the have you say results, initially they were done annually. We then moved to doing them every month, a section, excuse me, every month. Uh, and those were reviewed uh, by the business units, by the management team, uh, by the audit committee, and indeed by the board. Um, in each of those three cases, um, 
within Royal Mail rather than post office doing it? Uh, well, I think they did their own when it was reviewed by their business unit, so I'm assuming that they did that with theirs. I'm not sure, I genuinely can't recall whether Have Your Say for the Post Office obviously covered all the people who worked for the Post Office as personnel, and that would include the people in the Crown offices. Uh, they often talked about doing a separate one for the agents, but I'm not, or the sub postmasters, I'm not sure if they ever did that or not. I genuinely can't recall. But I've taken from your evidence there that that was a. Um in each case, a poll, a post office run function. Yes, it was. Yeah. And the results of it were looked at and analysed by the post office. Correct, and then on to the post office board. I'm looking for something that jumped from the agents, as you called them, the sub postmasters, to you and your board. Was there a facility to do that without going through either of those mechanisms that the uh, post office uh, managed? Uh, I don't believe there was, no. I think it's right that you made limited appearances at Post Office Limited board meetings, is that right? Uh, I think it was uh, two which were both uh, in between David Mills leaving at the end of 2005 and Alan Cook arriving in March or April 2006 and partly, well in fact only because those two meetings were uh, very strongly about the latest negotiations with government around the subsidy uh, to ensure that we were able to sign the company off as a going concern. You um, say in your statement, no need to turn it up, it's paragraph 27, that you attended those meetings um, be because they were in relation to matters of shared interest. Yes. And so why was it that you attended two board meetings um, of the post office board in your seven and a bit years uh, as CEO? Um, for a, a number of different reasons. No, number one, uh, when I arrived, uh, the CEO of the post office was David Mills, uh, who reported directly to uh, Alan Layton, the chair of Royal Mail. Uh, so I was not involved in the running of the post office. That was a direct line relationship. Uh, and uh, when it switched to Alan Cook, Alan had a slightly more normal dual um, reporting, which was to obviously to the board of the post office and the chairman of the post office on one hand, and then to me with regards to how post office interface with the Royal Mail Group, for instance, funding or the commercial relationship between the two companies. Uh, and I was advised by the company secretary that uh, it was uh, the, both the shareholder and the board wanted the two things kept separate and therefore I shouldn't be on that board. We've spoken about um, the responsibility uh, on post office executive team and its board to refer things up to Royal Mail Management Board and the main board. What um, Were there any mechanisms for uh, other uh, main board members or management board members to, as it were, go down into the post office board to take a look at what was going on? Yes, there were. So because what we were trying to do was a very big people and cultural transformation, and certainly on the Royal Mail side, a huge technology uh, revolution in terms of putting in sorting machines and tracking and tracing for parcels and what have you, and very unusually we had our Group HR director on the board of the Royal Mail and the Group Technology director on the board of the Royal Mail. And obviously those also had tentacles into the post office in terms of people uh, and technology. Uh, equally, Alan Layton, who was chair of Royal Mail, was also on the post office board. And the company secretary, Jonathan Evans, was company secretary on the Royal Mail board and attended all the poll boards as well. So were the principal links between the two through Mr. Layton and Mr. Evans? Correct. Can we look, please, at uh, poll 0036 to 335?
and page 20, please. And can we rotate it, please? 90 degrees clockwise. We can't, um, I'm told. <laughs> Uh, I can't date this because it, bec it comes within a loosely assembled pack of papers. Right. Um, and it's not dated itself. But given it's got the chairman of the PLC as Alan Layton and David Mills as CEO of Post Office, it must be before 2006, right? Uh, yes. And it, as we see at the top, um, the chairman as Alan Layton the Deputy Chairman, Elmar Toyn. Yes. Um, off to the left, the Company Secretary of Royal Mail Holdings as Jonathan Evans. Mm -hmm. um, the Chief Executive of Royal Mail, you. And then a line round to company-wide functions from you. Yes. And then two direct responsibilities, parcel for force worldwide and logistics to you, yes? Y yes. Then on the right-hand side, we see, um, so w we should have worked our way across the business units, Parcel Force, Logistics, Royal Mail Letters, GLS, Royal Mail International. And on the right-hand side, Post Office Limited. Yes. That has, um, um, obviously, David Mills as the chief executive as this time, at this time. It has a line... I think into Alan Layton, the chairman of Royal Mail Holdings PLC. That would be correct, wouldn't it? That would be correct, yes. Not to the deputy uh, chairman. No. That would be correct. Yes. Not into Jonathan Evans. No. That's correct as well, is it? Also correct, yes. And then I think the, the line goes across to you. Would that be correct? Uh, in the sense that I reported into Alan Layton, yes. I see. Yeah. So all three, myself, Elmar and David, all reported in directly to Alan. Uh, and Elmar, as the executive deputy chairman, was in effect, I can't think of a better phrase, a, a first among equals. So was effectively the, the lead executive. So this diagram um, represents, or should be taken to represent, um, issues arising from David Mills, the chief executive of the post office, um, coming through you. No. No? No, not at all. No. As I said, he reported directly to Alan Layton. What does the line... Um, above the Chief Executive, Post Office Limited, David Mills, that comes up and goes across the page and comes back down to you, mean? No, I think that's just the way these things yeah. are drawn. It, it's uh, it's uh, it very clearly, he, all three of us directly reported individually into Alan Mason. And so we should take this to mean that you, um, at this time, had no role. You're on the opposite side of the diagram. Correct. And nothing relation, in relation to the Post Office pass through you or indeed any other part of Royal Mail Holdings um, except insofar as it went straight to the chairman. Correct. Thank you. That can come um, down. And is that a reflection of the great autonomy that the post office um, enjoyed? Uh, yes. You told us a moment ago that you think you attended two meetings of the post office board. When you didn't attend, did you um, receive minutes of the Post Office Board? Yes, the Royal Mail Holdings Board received minutes from each of the operating companies uh, were included in the board pack. And um, you said Royal Mail Holdings received them. Did you personally receive the minutes of the Post Office Board? Yes, as a director of Royal Mail Holdings, yes. Sorry. Did you receive the minutes of the Post Office Limited Committees? Uh, no, I don't think we did. I think... Uh, I'm thinking it, in particular of the Audit and Risk Committee. Uh, at the Audit and Risk Committee, I think if there was a, a, a poor audit that went to 
uh, the Royal Mail Audit and Committee meeting for further uh, looking and work. I'm not sure if they always received the minutes of the Risk Committee, no. And you personally didn't always receive the minutes of the Post Office Limited uh, Audit and Risk Committee? Did, I definitely did not, no. As far as I recall, I don't. Can we look at an example of a meeting of the Post Office Limited Board that you did attend? Yes. Poll double, uh, sorry, 302, 1492. We can see that it's a Post Office Limited Board meeting, 20th of April 2006. Yep. Uh, we can see those who are members of the committee who are present. And we can see in attendance, second down is you. That's correct, yes. Uh, can we look please at page four? Uh, we can see that the solvency of um, the post office was being addressed. Yes. And does that reflect the point that you made earlier, that the um, very uh, financial viability and existence of the post office was um, of a, a, a critical concern to you? It, it was, and it didn't just impact the post office, but obviously because of its scale, it impacted uh, the solvency of the group as a whole and the group's ability to sign its accounts as a going concern. Uh, Mr Corbett is recorded as outlining the company's current financial position in further detail. It was clear that the company was insolvent and that in the absence of support from its parent company or ultimate shareholder, that's the government, Correct. it would be unable to meet its debts as they fell due for the foreseeable future. Uh, it was reported to the board the government had agreed in principle with the support of Royal Mail to uh, write a letter to the company under which the government acknowledged the solvency issues facing. The directors of the company and directors were prepared to continue trading on uh, a going concern basis only on the uh, basis of the following support. And if we scroll down, um, we can see that it's um, set out. Yeah. And so was that why you were attending this meeting? It was, yes. Because it's a solvency of the uh, post office issue, which in turn affects the accounting and potential viability of Royal Mail Group. I I indeed. Uh, can we go on, please, to page 10? <laughs> and if we scroll down, please. Come, yes, thank you. We can see that there's an operations report and a document will have been produced. And then it's summarised, the Horizon S90 release. And uh, there's a four-point explanation um, of what um, the Horizon S90 release was. If you just read that um, to yourself. And then under C, uh, an issue of the um, network resilience um, was um, raised. Is, am I right in thinking that you would have picked these things up um, in a sense by chance because you were at this meeting? That's correct. And say for picking things like this, which are about horizon and network um, resilience up by chance, were you um, reliant, entirely reliant, on the information pushed up the line to you, uh, whether from the MD or CEO of the post office or from the company secretary? Uh, yes, or uh, if anything was brought to my attention by the group technology director. And how would that occur? Uh, he, the, the IT director in the post office would have reported to the CEO of the post office. That was a Sorry, it's management speak, but a hard line relationship. Yes. Uh, but the group technology director, who was largely focused on driving through this automation and modernization of raw mail, was also there for advice and help to the post office um, technology team if required. And so if, um, as we now know there to uh, be the case, there were, putting it neutrally, issues 
with the Horizon technology? Would you have expected, um, or was the system, uh, that um, the poll um, IT structure, the post office IT structure, would have pushed those issues up for your attention and for the Royal Mail Group board's attention through the group um, IT uh, director route? Well, first of all, I don't recall the Paul IT team ever doing that. Um, that's the first thing to say. Second of all, I would have expected them to raise it with the Paul executive team, first of all. That was the reporting lines. They were running and controlling the post office, and they had responsibility for Horizon. If they needed some technical expertise, uh, yes, I would have expected them uh, to speak to the group technology director. But if there were any real issues, that was why both the CEO of post office and chairman of post office were on the group board, was to enable them to have a direct line to uh, relay any issues in post office to the rest of the board. In paragraph um, 11 of your witness statement, which is on page four, if we can turn that up, please. Just wait for it to come up on the screen. Page four, please. And paragraph 11. You say, um, whilst you've tried to address as best you can your recollection of the corporate structure, I must stress that my responses are not in any way uh, intended to detract from the fact that it's clear to me now that this structure did not help facilitate vital information regarding Horizon and the conduct of criminal proceedings reaching me or the board of Royal Mail as it should have done. There's no need to turn it up, but you make precisely the same point in paragraph 98.1 of your witness statement on page 33. And before getting into the detail, can we address first um, what you say is clear to you now, but was not clear to you presumably at the time? Firstly, what in the corporate structure prevented or did not facilitate vital information from reaching you and the board? I think it was, if I may expand a little, I think it was a, uh, this is a reflection trying to help in the sense of what could have gone wrong here. Um, I should stress at the time, uh, actually it made perfect sense to me because the two companies had been set up with such a different objective one in an entirely commercial market, one really trying to become a sustainable uh, public sector, uh, a public service, uh, and one that needed to modernise at enormous speed as it opened up to competition, and the other one that absolutely had difficult issues in terms of managing the size of the network, but largely through uh, the same business, if you like, as it had previously had, albeit with less government revenue and more financial services revenue. I think the issue, looking back, that I could see that was unhelpful was actually one in the way which it impacted on the two attitudes or cultures of the two companies, which is that in Royal Mail, because everything, as I said earlier, was fundamentally broken, uh, everyone on the board was aware of that. The starting position was everything didn't work and therefore there was no option but total, utter transparency because if anyone had brought a presentation saying everything's fine, they wouldn't have been believed. So it was all about getting everything out on the table, transparently dealing with it and trying to make progress. I worry with the benefit of hindsight that because Paul didn't have that same burning bridge, for want of a better phrase, that that same transparency didn't allow information to flow up through that governance system on its own and that potentially the separation of the two aided and abetted uh, people not getting at that information. Here you point to the corporate structure prevented or didn't help facilitate. What about the corporate structure rather than the culture within each organisation? Uh, what acted as a bar in the corporate structure to the provision of information to Royal Mail? I think just because internally it was very clear that people worked for the post office or the rest of the group, I think it just generated that sense of 
two different companies. Uh, and I think uh, the structure just, again, benefit of hindsight, I think, if it didn't allow for the easy flow of information. What was the vital information about Horizon, which the structure of the companies prevented you from being told about? Um, I, as far as I recall, I don't remember anyone in the post office governance system, whether that's the board, the risk committee, the exec team, uh, the general counsel, the legal teams, most importantly, the operations and IT teams who own Horizon, I don't remember uh, any of those people flagging up any concerns in that system. Well, I don't know whether they flagged it internally, but it never reached uh, the holdings board. What was the vital information about the conduct of criminal proceedings, which the structure prevented you from being told about? Um, I think, for me, uh, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, um, but um, it's clear to me that the central to all of this is the issue of disclosure. Um, I noted um, more recently uh, the judgments uh, of the appeals court, and clearly there were some material uh, uh, deficiencies with the disclosure process. That seems very, very clear. What was it about the structure that prevented or did not help facilitate information about the conduct of criminal proceedings from reaching you? We're going to come on to it after lunch, but um, the proceedings were um, instituted, um, pursued, and completed by a legal team that sat within Royal Mail Holdings, not the post office. Yeah. Working with the post office team. Uh, and I don't recall the company secretary, uh, Jonathan Evans, who had responsibility uh, for that area, um, talking about that at any of the holdings board meetings. That's a separate issue, Mr. Crozier, okay. whether in fact he, he talked about it. What was it about the structure that um, did not help facilitate, as you say, information about the conduct of criminal proceedings I, reaching I, the Board of Royal Mail. I'm not sure I mentioned anything about the structure specifically with regards to that question. It's this sentence here that's on the screen. It's now clear to me that this structure did not help vital information regarding dot, 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 the conduct of criminal proceedings reaching me. What, what about the structure prevented information about criminal proceedings reaching you or the board? Um, I think I was winning more with regards to Horizon than the proceedings themselves. So that's an appropriate moment to break if we, um, uh, if we may. It's quarter past now. I wonder whether you'd mind breaking until five past two. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. <laughs>